Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to our online uh, training workshop on effectiveness to local public governance for SDG implementation organized by United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs through its, through its uh, uh, United Nations Project Office on Governance of the Division for Public Institution and Digital Govern Government. Uh, I'm Pravin Maharjan from UNPOZ DPI DG UN DESA. I'll be moderating this session. On behalf of UN DESA, I would like to thank all the participants for joining the workshop today. The training workshop intends to develop capacities of government officials and other stakeholders responsible for SDG local localization by introducing approaches, strategies, and tools for enhancing national to local public governance for SDG implementation. Now, it is my great pleasure to invite Mr. Bokyun Sim, head of United Nations Project Office on Governance, DPI DG UN DESA, to deliver his opening remarks. Mr. Sim, you have the floor. Thank you, Prabeng. Uh, dear colleagues from customer countries and honorable Professor Wang jun Sok and the students from SNU ITPP program and uh, other participants, my name is Bo Gyun Shim, head of UNPOG, a part of the Division for Public Institutions and Digital Government of UNDESA. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this online training workshop. I am deeply grateful to Seoul National University and the Professor uh, Bang Jun Sok for helping me with the workshop today for piloting a toolkit. And thank you to those who attended this workshop as an audience. Implementing the 2030 agenda will depend on how the SDGs are coordinated and implemented through national to local governance. The UN SEPA calls for elaborating local 2030 agendas, which could link global goals to the local action and raise awareness of sustainable development. The relationship between national and local government should be based on effective collaboration and coordination, and the resources of local governments should be commensurate with their responsibilities. So UNPOG has developed three toolkits, including a training toolkit for effective coordination between the national and the local government. We already launched a toolkit on social inclusion for the vulnerable last month, and the other two will be released in April as scheduled, today is the time for us, the toolkit developer to do a workshop using this training toolkit on a pilot basis ahead of the release of for effective coordination between the national and the local government. This toolkit is made up of five modules. You don't have to read all the modules at once. Uh, you can refer to only the modules you need. And this year, we plan to convert these toolkits into an online course and develop the toolkits as a handbook. Most policies are delivered to citizens through localization. At the center of the localization process is the local government. Some people might think the local governments are weaker than central governments. However, it does not mean the local governments are not important. From a citizen's point of view, the state of government is encountered through local governments. And no matter how good a policy is formed by the national government and sent to local governments, it cannot be properly implemented and delivered unless local governments adjust it to the local reality and their context making it understandable to the citizens to com communicate with the citizens. If local governments do not collaborate with the, the national government, policies can be frustrating. In this COVID-19, local governments took the lead in promoting citizens' safety and the uh, local economic vitality. So the citizen support for some local governments increased. As evidenced by the current COVID-19 pandemic, the complexity and interconnected nature of risk requires integrated multi-level governance systems 
and in an inclusive multi-stakeholder approach to care for the communities, ensure the provision of basic services and reinforce local solidarity networks to protect the most vulnerable. Multi-level coordination and collaboration with other spheres of government and local stakeholders have pro proved a quintessential part of this strategy, as is the engagement in and the promotion of more accountable strategy, strategies for emergency governance. Since 2014, um, UNPOG has been providing capacity support to member states in strengthening multi-level governance. This training workshop is part of our continued efforts to support member states in strengthening effective national to local public governance for SDG implementation. I look forward to insightful discussions and your active participation. I hope you will all enjoy this training workshop. I wish you a great success. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sim, for your opening remarks. Uh, now it is my great pleasure to invite Professor John, John Sok Kwang, Director of Seoul National University Global R&D Center to deliver his opening remarks. Professor Huang, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Prabin, and also uh, thank you, Mr. Bogun Shim, you know, uh, the head of our uh, UN uh, Project Office of Governance. Uh, first of all, it's my great honor, you know, to have an opening remark, you know, on these very meaningful and well-prepared, you know, events as a training workshop, you know, for the toolkit of to strengthen the government officer, especially for local capability, you know, to, to achieve uh, the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, you know, which we all uh, UN community committed, you know, to accomplish in, you know, coming 10 years. Um, I have actually in my talk, I, uh, you know, in my opening, I have, you know, three, you know, important messages, you know, uh, that, that can be framed you know, first uh, the, the congratulatory remark and also the thanking remark and finally acknowledging remark. So as a, you know, congratulatory remark, I'd like to actually give a congratulations to Yandessa and Umpak, you know, to have this very meaningful initiative. You know, by my top partnership with RGRC and Umpak have been actually giving me uh, to have a great understanding that how UNPOG and UNDESA have been committed for last decades, uh, you know, to strengthen uh, the public capability, especially uh, to strengthen, you know, for the innovative, you know, governance. And truly the, our UN uh, organization, the UNDESA and uh, UNPOG uh, have been, uh, you know, uh, the, the proof, the, the importance of governors, uh, importance of the governance you know, to uh, make our ideal, you know, and the, the, the need to be into the practice as a public uh, community. Truly, the, the, uh, the uh, UNSDG is one of, you know, the, the very important 17 goals that, you know, all our humanity have been agreed on. But, you know, how to practice that SDG is not an easy thing. As we uh, remember, you know, governance is, you know, very important part of it and global partners, very important part of it. UMPOG and Mendesa have been dedicated actually to do these kind of, you know, very meaningful missions and their capability and contribution have been actually, you know, shown to me and also shown to us today as a part of the toolkit. This is not about just one session event. The toolkit that will they actually you now share with us will be distributed to all the community, all the government officers in the world. Hopefully, you know we engage and we, you know, have, can have a more cooperative uh, and united act on uh, to accomplish uh, uh, the UNSDG. So I really like to you know give my great uh, uh, you know congratulatory remark you know the messages to Umpok and all the members, especially also Mr. Bogun Shim, you know, who is the head of UNPOG, you know, for your, you know, great start of this toolkit. You know, I wish, you know, your 
uh, vision and your uh, commitment has been proven to the benefit of our global humanity, uh, especially in our government officers who will raise their leadership in their country. Secondly, you know, I'd like to actually give my thanking remark you know, to inviting our, our SNU to be part of it as a, your pilot in you know, a toolkit. And certainly university is the place where we can experiment many things and where we can actually, you know, find the new ways of living to improve our global society. And having us to be the partner of the UN is a great honor again as a academia. Uh, Mr. Shim was the one first to, to give me a call without knowing me, you know, in person, but you know, that, uh, uh, but, you know, sharing his vision to cooperate with us. You know, that was a very inclusive uh, embracement, you know, for me. And that embracement was not for me and for university. I think his heart, you know, toward to our student, who are especially selected from all, all around the world as a government officers, you know, who are the, you know, next generation leaders. I really, you know, thank and appreciate uh, Mr. Shim and also your colleague member, you know, of visiting us in uh, uh, in the you know, in those days, and then you know, uh, giving us a hand to have a cooperation. I think with that's the day of the start. We finally come into this in you know, another invitation, you know, as a learning and the toolkit. I'm very you know thankful for giving us uh, such a great learning environment. We, are, we have learned a lot already, you know, from your organization, from UN, but at the same time, uh, you know, from the person, from Shim and also Prabin and from many people, you know, who are great professional, they give us great learning as a, you know, a global leader. I hope our students really benefit, uh, you know, from your learning. And I think my students are all same with me as a government officers and as a public innovator to thank and appreciate the UN member, you know, and also UN PELC, you know, colleagues. I thank you all, you know, for your great friendship and trust and these services you are doing, you know, great for the humanity. We'll join you after we learn and we will, you know, diffuse all your, you know, effort to the world as your messenger. You know, I committed, you know, to do that, you know, give my all in you know, words to all the words. And as you know that we have been actually doing this scholarship and capacity building for uh, program for last 18 years, continuously. Full scholarship, full living expenses, one of the honorable you know, lectures, which I believe it was a you know, great commitment. Our vision is to make this one as a permanent scholarship for the government officers who are the leader of the country, who are the leader of locality, who are the leader of the nation, finally, who are the leader of the humanity, truly, our government officers, like my student, have a great, great dream to make a great things for our humanity. I hope uh, this, you know, your, you know, uh, the contribution will be you know, returned by our thanking of our acts and practice for our community after we start and also while we are doing research, finally, when we are serving for our country, for our locality. Finally, you know, as a, you know, acknowledging messages, I'd like to acknowledge, you know, the, the, our students. As you know that, that how much they committed to learn about this, you know, capacity building. I haven't seen that much of really motivated and inspired leaders from young generation, other than the, my, our, you know, ITPP, uh, you know, alumni and our ITPP students. I think you will, you know, many of the also invited our client countries, you know, government officers, you know, from uh, over you, your empire will see the, the great community we are having. I'd like to acknowledge their commitment. And I, I'd like to also, you know, have them to, you know, their uh, contribution to their society. And also our alumni are committed to do similar things. I'd like to acknowledge their contribution in our uh, in a learning environment. I hope uh, the, uh, you know, that such acknowledgement will go toward to the, all the attendees and participation 
uh, in this you know, training workshop. As an opening remark, you know, I really thank you again for uh, giving me a chance to give uh, you know, great messages to you. And you know, I always you know, being uh, very honored to be invited. And I look forward to you know, learning a lot from through this workshop. I hope all of you have also green great learning experience, which can be acted, you know, as for the, for the benefit of your people. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Huang, for your opening remarks. Uh, it, it is indeed really motivating for all the government officials as well as uh, all the students out there. So uh, before starting the first session, I would like to give a brief overview of this online training workshop. And uh, this two-day online training workshop is a pilot testing of the training toolkit on the same topic. Uh, that is effectiveness to local public governance for SDG implementation, which is developed as a part of UN Desa DPIDG's curriculum on governance for the SDGs. The workshop is composed of four thematic sessions. Some selected modules from the toolkit will be covered during uh, the two-day training workshop. Today, we'll cover two sessions on effective institutions and whole of government approach for localization and national to local governance for effective public uh, health emergency management. Uh, for day two on March 13 next week, we'll begin with session three, which will address a uh, role of society approach for SDG localization. And uh, session four will focus on financing for SDG localization. The training will also include thematic, uh, will include thematic presentations, innovative practices and group discussion, which will help participants uh, transform in-depth learning into practices. And uh, the audience will also have chance to interact with the speaker during the discussion session. Next slide, please. Uh, we also invite all participants to join online discussion board on UNPOG website, as well uh, as all the training related materials will be uploaded here. And continued discussion among the participants will take place on the online discussion board. Uh, the draft toolkit will also be available on the online discussion board soon after your uh, learning reference, for your learning reference, as well as your, for your feedbacks. Uh, we'd like to request all the participants to review uh, the toolkit uh, via the link provided in the chat box. We'll uh, send you later. And uh, please, please let us know if you have any queries or questions via Zoom chat box. We look forward to watch your very active participations uh, during the workshop. Uh, without further ado, now I would like to uh, begin the first session on effective institution and whole of uh, government approach for localization. Uh, so now I would like to uh, uh, once again invite Mr. Bokin Sim to deliver a presentation on the need to build effective, accountable, and inclusive institution at all level, uh, all level in achieving the SDGs, uh, all the SDGs and targets. Mr. Sim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Praveen. And before I start my presentation, I'd like to express my uh, gratitude to uh, Honorable, Honorable uh, Professor Wang for his uh, warm-hearted compliments and commitments. Uh, I think uh, the partnership with the SNU uh, would be very much uh, uh, helpful to uh, accelerate the implementation of SDGs, uh, especially uh, Professor Wang and SNU has a rich uh, experience in uh, uh, realizing the global uh, v uh, grand vision for uh, uh, international cooperation and also uh, for SDGs. He is uh, very committed uh, for SDG implementation. So I'm delighted uh, to have a solid uh, partnership with uh, academia uh, from SNU and uh, led by uh, Professor Huang. Thank you again. Uh, and I uh, uh, now uh, let's get started uh, with my presentation. Uh, member states uh, are making concerted progress in implementing the Sustainable Development Goals since the adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable to National Circumstances and Priorities, aligning and incorporating the 17 goals and 169 targets into policies 
and the development direction. Effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions that provide access to justice are based on the e effective rule of law, respond to the needs of people, and provide timely, appropriate, and equitable access to services. I will explain about that uh, in the later part. Uh, slide two next. Uh, these are some topics I will talk about. Next, effectiveness is almost defined with respect to an outside objective or goal. Uh, the effectiveness of institutions should be measured in terms of how well they support the realization of specific goals and targets. Uh, institutions are the rules of a society or of organizations that facilitate coordination among people. Uh, next, uh, institutions uh, can be both formal and informal. Core formal institutions include laws, contracts, and formal public management processes. Effective institutions can take many forms, robust legal frameworks and representative parliaments with a strong capacity for oversight, adapt civil services and the timely and quality delivery of, of public services, efficient judiciaries that uphold the role of law, vibrant and active engaged civil societies, and free and independent media. Yeah, these uh, institutions depend on the development of decentralized, inclusive decision-making processes. Next. Uh, an effective uh, institutional framework at the national and some national levels regularly provide information sources that will enable monitoring and evaluation processes. Next. Uh, there are several uh, persistent barriers to success. Uh, as you see, a lack of government leadership and ownership, application of technocratic one-size-fits-all approaches, not tailored to countries' context, complex political economy challenges. There are they, they are the uh, main uh, barriers, and also poor sequencing and frequent changes in management strategies as well as overly rigid management purposes. Uh, they are called as uh, barriers. Next, SDG 16 aims to promote peaceful, inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. SD16 is an engine for progress and on in an enabling tool for all other goals. Uh, institutional principles encapsulated in SDG16 targets one is uh, substantially reduce corruption and bribery in all their forms. Two is develop effective, accountable, and transparent institutions at all levels. Three is ensure responsive, inclusive, participatory, and representative decision-making at all levels. Four is ensure public access to information, protect fundamental freedoms, Five is promote and enforce non-discriminatory laws and policies for sustainable development. Next. Uh, to ensure integrated implementation of the sustainable development agenda, institution needs to collaborate or, uh, on implementation of policies coherently across the spheres, remain agile and responsive to dramatic changes, give primers to human rights, including equality and non-discrimination. All these things are very important elements 
next. Uh, according to the economic uh, uh, UN DESA principles, which is, was uh, endorsed by the Economic and the Social Council, the 11 principles of effective governance for sustainable development, there are uh, the principles for the uh, effectiveness, there are three elements, as you see, competence, sound policy making, and collaboration. For the accountability, there are three elements, integrity, transparency, independent oversight. For the inclusiveness, there are five elements. Next. Uh, for the effectiveness, uh, there are uh, competence element. Institutions must have a sufficient expertise, resources, and tools to adequately fulfill the mandates under their authority. Sound policy making, collaboration. These are also very important. Uh, public policies should be coherent with one another and uh, founded on true well-established grounds. A collaboration, without collaboration, you cannot reach the SDGs because the SDGs are cross-cutting. So every ministries or agencies and all levels of government and all sectors should work together. Uh, next, for the accountability, there are three elements. Civil servants should discharge official duties honestly, fairly, with the soundness of moral principle. Uh, transparency, yeah, institutions should be open and candid in the execution of their function and promote access to information. And also the oversight in, uh, agencies uh, should act strict three professional considerations and uh, apart from and unaffected by others. Next, uh, leaving no one signed, one behind uh, public policies are to take into account the needs and aspirations of all segments of society. Next. Uh, building uh, effective uh, institutions, strengthening competencies to develop competencies in the public sector that can support implementation of the 2030 agenda uh, for promoting sound policy making and the policy coherence. The actions to progress towards goal 16 should be informed by the interlinkages with all the other goals for improving public private partnerships. Uh, these days, uh, the public sector cannot solve all the public issues. They should collaborate together. They should have a solid partnership to ensure the governments, the private sector and the civil society each have a clear role to play within a well-defined accountability framework. And the laws and regulations governing such arrangements recognize the centrality of the public interest. And for building accountable institutions, uh, first, uh, you, you, you should foster a culture of accountability uh, and also first accountability in public service delivery. Uh, for building inclusive institutions, public policies should take into account the needs and the aspirations of all segments of society, including the poorest and the most vulnerable and those subject to discrimination. Uh, and you should promote non-discriminatory laws and policies and strengthen the role 
of the government, local governments. Local governments are well placed to design and implement solutions at the grassroots level. For example, local housing solutions for the homeless and the capacity building for local governments and training of locally elected officials remains a great concern in making progress towards the achievement of the goals. Next. Governments need to strengthen the digital and data analysis, analytic skills of public servants for effective evidence-based policymaking and successful implementation of digital strategies. If you face very challenging uh, crisis, you can solve the uh, issues by analyzing big data. And so the, the data analytics skills are increasingly important. In particular, during the COVID-19 crisis, digital government tools and the skills and the data analytics skills have been widely used it was very useful. Digital government has become a public sector innovation driver and accelerator as it challenges and encourages institutions for usage of latest technologies and trends for the achievement of SDGs. Data is a key resource for deploying digital government in implementing the SDGs. There's a need to amplify the central role of government data both as an input and output in steering and uh, informing policy options without timely and quality data, institutions would not know the gaps and be able to identify the right policy options. Next. Uh, digital government bo boosts the SDG localization, big data and e-government can facilitate the effective implementation of sustainable development through the localization of the SDGs. To effectively localize SDGs, reforms should target a fair raise of tax revenues, meet local requirements, and establish an easily administrable and stable revenue stream. There are systems and big data solutions can help in this regard and can be coupled with institutional capacity at a local level. This allows local governments to release potential revenue sources to support local economic development. Digitalized financing and the accounting system at all levels of government to make the financing system uniform and incorporated so that it can be shared, disaggregated and analyzed quickly. Yeah, there are uh, some examples in the developing countries. Bangladesh SDG tracker enables tracking of Bangladesh's poor progress towards attainment of SDGs and uh, other national development goals through a web-based information rep repository. The SDG India index uh, tracks the progress of all the states and the union territories on a set of 100 national indicators derived from the national indicator framework, measuring their progress on the outcomes of interventions and the schemes of the government of India. It provides a holistic view on the social, economic, and environmental status of the country. Next, effective local institutions are key to development uh, that is inclusive and sustainable. In order for local governments to cooperate with the central governments in implementing the SDGs, it is, is necessary to establish a close co cooperation and communication system between the central and the local government leaders. For example, in Korea, consultation and the coordination between the prime minister and the heads of the local governments or deputy groups have been conducted almost daily. 
through video conferences. Next, building effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at the local level become more important as the COVID-19 pandemic is putting our communities, cities, and territories under unprecedented strain and is also having a direct impact on the SDGs. Ensuring the provision of basic services, not just for containing the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also for making sure that no one is left behind either during the outbreak or in its aftermath, striving to take appropriate action to protect their local communities that include engaging in collective learning and exchanging knowledge and processes between different cities based on the principle of the solidarity and fostering the solidarity of communities and making it possible for civil society to become together, come together, to come together and contribute to the resilience of our communities. This brings to the close of my presentation. I'll be happy to answer if you have any questions in the Q&A se session. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. Over to you, Pravin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sim, for highlighting that institution's uh, plan and concrete actions to stimulate uh, empowerment, inclusiveness, and equality should be informed by the 11 principles of effective governance for sustainable development. And institution enabled by this effective uh, governance will be critical for providing and expanding the social and economic safety net and social assistance to those for this left behind. Uh, now I would like to present on the need of whole of government approach for SDG uh, localization. <clears throat> uh, sorry, I have one question to previous speaker. Uh, we uh, can have the question and answer session uh, after uh, this presentation later. Okay, fine. Yeah, thank you very much for your understanding. So uh, a whole of government approach is very is a way to ensure policy coherence that responds to the need of better coordination between national and local institutions. Uh, this approach entails uh, moving away from like fragmented and si silo-based sector strategies to a holistic approach where uh, vertical and horizontal uh, collaboration help build synergies between the SDGs. Next slide, please. So these are some uh, topics I'm gonna cover. Next slide, please. So uh, what is the whole of government? So it is an overarching term for a group of response to the problem of increased fragmentation of the public sector and public services and wish to increase uh, in integration, coordination and capacity. So it is defined as uh, one where a government actively uses formal and or for informal network across the different agencies uh, within that government to coordinate the design and implementation of the range of intervention that the government government's agencies will be making in order to increase the effectiveness of those intervention in achieving the desired objective. Next slide, please. So uh, there are different aspects of all of government approach and like some of the objectives are macro politics objectives where, uh, you know, the rational, one of the rational for all of government approach can be found in like some countries at the broader political level linked to stances of uh, government regarding the delivery of public services. And uh, it is also a response as a response to the wicked problem. So, uh, you know, uh, and it is also one of the strategic enabler uh, for the government, like some government uh, see whole of government approach as an effective means of dealing with high level strategic policy issues such as defense and national security. And it is also a means of managing crisis, uh, planning for crisis such as a natural or man-made disaster or major health, uh, uh, pan health pandemic represent a relatively common focus of whole of government uh, project work. Next slide, please. So there are several rationale for uh, you know, adopting the whole of government approach. So one of the approach, uh, approach uh, rationale is to eliminate the silos or department working in isolation from uh, one another and achieve seamless uh, government. It aims to avoid 
having different policies cut across and undermine each other and to optimize impact of government by using all the instruments at the disposal of the state in an integrated way in support of a particular outcome like the SDGs. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, one example. You can see how uh, central government, state government, and local government are uh, interlinked for the for the you know their development plan. And so net network can be for, formed at different level: intra-departmental, interdepartmental, intergovernmental, or intersectoral also. So it results in a functional rather than uh, organizational view of our uh, government. Next slide, please. Uh, however, there are uh, several challenges for all of government approaches, like structural structural challenges. So uh, the problem of uh, you know coordination and collaboration across uh, boundaries with autonomy of organization and with vertical control appear to be fundamental dif uh, difficulty embedded in the structure of government. And uh, for cultural challenges, uh, just as you know, culture change is seen as fundamental enabler for whole of government work. Cultural barriers are thought to present the greatest obstacle also. And uh, there are several practical challenges. Uh, so like um, uh, it can be very time consuming. It requires individual to put you know, their own agenda aside. Uh, it might be uh, difficult to measure in terms of its success. It might, be, it might have poorly defined incap, uh, incompatible goals and frequently involves uh, competing policies and communities agenda. And uh, there is also uh, challenges, uh, evaluation challenges. Uh, given the complex issue that, you know, whole of government approaches tend to tackle, like uh, interestable social issues, unexpected crisis, evaluation is a multifaceted, uh, complicated process. Now, next slide, please. So there are uh, certain uh, enablers for uh, whole of government. For example, structure. Uh, for any whole of government initiative, a set of practical structure or arrangement are embed are needed to make it happen. So the choice of this depends on the purpose, on the lifetime of the initiative. Like short term initiative may rely on more informal structure, and uh, while the project intended to bring about uh, significant long term change may need more strongly embedded uh, system including uh, legislation, organizational redesign, new process and new competencies. So the most commonly used structure uh, are interdepartmental committees, task force, interdepartmental uh, partnership, cross-departmental partnership, special purpo uh, purpose agencies. Uh, and uh, for as for work progress, so effective whole of government work depend on the alignment of core work pro uh, processes so that they are supporting, they are supportive of um, whole of government approach. Uh, key approaches include accountability system, budget and information management, as well as the management of critical gaps. And uh, for the political and leadership leaders, uh, political and administrative leadership. So whole of government, uh, like the leadership is seen as specialized kind of leadership that enables politicians to make to manage the complex institutional arrangement that all of government work requires. So uh, the style of political leadership is referred to as like craftsman style, the ability to receive uh, policy implementation process to be better fit for community needs by receiving mandates, system, structures, and program. And uh, for culture and capacities, the link between organizational behavior and organizational performance emerged as a strong focus in whole of government work. Uh, some, some has uh, noted that, you know, how organizational culture can support or frustrate the achievement of join up uh, government goal. And uh, so the last one, supporting for capacity building. Uh, capacity development need will according to, you know, the pre-existing level of ex experience and expertise. Uh, capacity building needs will be, will be greater where new roles and procedures must be created. Next slide, please. And uh, for the implementation of whole of government, there are certain things we need to uh, cap 
capitalize like stakeholder uh, consultation and buy-in for example identify all the stakeholder on whose work involvement or cooperation the success of implementation depends and for leadership like uh, for example secure political and administrative leadership of key ministries and senior public officials at the outset and across the lifetime of the project and for resources uh, like uh, we need to determine how the budget for policy implementation will be secured, where accountability rests, and how accountabilities will be shared if appropriate. And uh, for implementation structure and teams, so we need to identify the whole of government structure that fit with the particular initiative. And uh, during the implementation of planning, we need to set the objective of whole of government initiative and the expected outcome. And uh, we also need to develop the uh, capacity of uh, the public servants, like prepare and implement, this, implement the strategy for building staff capacity, including uh, staff selection, training, and coaching, and uh, all the stuff. And for learning from experience, also very important, like we need to set up formal system to capture and share the learning and experience about all of government approach. Next slide, please. So there are certain characteristics of uh, the coordinating structure. Uh, evidence from uh, VNR presented in the high-level uh, political forum, uh, you know, suggests that countries seem to either using existing structure or creating new ones. There are very uh, lots of examples uh, in the VNR reports. And uh, for the leadership approach, like member states choose a leadership approach based on what is most appropriate and logical for the governmental system. And there is no single approach that fits all the cases. It all depends on the political culture of the member states and its historical uh, traditions. And uh, me, uh, so leadership under the office of prime minister or presidency, presidency co-chaired with the ministry. So having a co-chaired leadership may combine the advantage of approaches mentioned above. And uh, co-chairing means uh, that, you know, the ability to steer a whole of government approach and to ensure that all the ministries and uh, are mainstreaming the stages in their policies, including, uh, which also include uh, local leadership as well. And uh, we also need to involve uh, the civil society organization, like some coordinating body involve only government representative. This means that you know, a non-government actor can have an advisory role and can be consulted by uh, the government, but do not necessarily work with the government within the uh, coordinating structure. And one of the important is involvement of a subnational representative or local representative. So which include actors from local, local up to the national offer, uh, offer a variety of advantages. You know, it allows representative participation in the coordinating structure. It is an effective way for national government to absorb actual delivery of the 2030 agenda and the SDGs from the local up uh, to the national level. And uh, next slide, please. So these are some examples uh, I want to show, like the Belize, uh, a, a strategy for strengthening cross-sectoral uh, co coordination. So Be Belize uh, aligned the 2030 agenda to its long-term national development plan uh, that is Horizon 2030. To implement this plan, Belize develop uh, the growth and sustainable development strategies, which is five-year development plan. And the strategy links economic, social, and environmental policy at the national and subnational level. To operationalize uh, the SDGs, the Ministry of Economic Development in partnership with Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Forestry, the Environmental, sustainable development and immigration of the uh, government, develop a monitoring and evaluation framework. And uh, we have another example from Georgia. Next slide, please. So uh, Georgia also in, the, in by 2017, um, uh, the government of Georgia has introduced its SDG architecture, a multi-stakeholder SDG council, uh, four thematic groups on democratic governance and economic uh, environmental and social dimension of sustainable development and annual forum where the member of the SDG Council come together to share and debate experience related to SDG implementation. Next slide, please. 
uh, this is another example of Mongolia aligning policies to the 2030 agenda and the standing policy coherence. Uh, next slide, please. So there are certain uh, policy and policy uh, and programming recommendations like ensuring policy coherence in SDG implementation, like government need to reform uh, institutional arrangement to work across sector, both vertically and horizontally, and political leadership is needed to promote and incentivize uh, coordination and collaboration across institutional at all level. An important one is involving subnational stakeholders. Governments should uh, uh, privilege local level consultation mechanism on SDG prioritization and uh, planning and monitoring. And regional and local governments should use the opportunity of uh, localizing the SDGs to pursue open government initiative. And this local government need to establish local SDG implementation plan linked to national SDG uh, development plans. And also uh, the local government and statistics office need to establish baseline and um, monitor locally drawing on sources of data relevant to local priorities. And there are other uh, uh, recommendations like um, cross-cutting role of digital technologies, providing supports, uh, performance management system and other all. Uh, next slide, please. Now uh, I conclude my uh, presentation. Now we'll begin with the group discussion. All the participants will be uh, assigned to uh, separate groups and our colleague will uh, facilitate the group. And uh, so I would also like to uh, uh, request, you know, the participant to select group leader and rapporteur for each group. And after the group discussion, we'll invite uh, one or two group to share their outcome on, of their discussion in plenary. And after reporting to the plenary session, we'll have a Q&A with presenter for some time. So if you have any question, please post your question in the chat chat box later. So uh, uh, can, can we go to the uh, group discussion, please? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Hello. Hello. Okay, Hello. great. Uh, thank you for joining this uh, forum. And as Mr. Par uh, Pravin Marjan said, uh, it would be much appreciated if uh, we can all first introduce each other and uh, choose perhaps a group leader and a repertoire um, so that we can potentially present uh, in the main plenary. Are there any volunteers uh, for the group leader? Perhaps uh, Mr. Batbarrier, is that how uh, I would No, 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 no. I'm not good at lead as someone. I just don't follow you guys. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't think I quite hear you. Um, perhaps your mic microphone Hello. is muted. Hello. Hello. Yes, sorry. Hello. How about uh, Mr. Antoine? Uh, would you like to be the group leader? I don't think I'm capable to be a group leader. Uh, what, what, what is this? Like? What I have to do? Uh, for group discussions, if, our, um, if Mingyang or Jisoo can upload the and share the group questions, that would be much appreciated. Thank you, Jisoo. Yes, so we're going to be covering these four questions. And so Antoine, if you can address the questions and perhaps also provide your feedback on the questions and your answers 
as well as interact with uh, other participants here. That would be great. Thank you so much. So who is who is present here in this group? As all the people listening, maybe. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So we will be covering the first uh, question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I ask you a question, maybe before? Sure. Uh, what is like vertical and horizontal coordination? I'm not uh, sure about this term mm -hmm. actually. So I think uh, Mr. Prabhupada Marjan mentioned in his uh, presentation about a certain vertical coordination, which may be uh, including uh, the local uh, subnational uh, governments in the process of um, implementing the SDGs and uh, working across uh, and engaging other stakeholders that may also in top-down, bottom-up approaches include vertical coordination. If this clarifies that. Uh, then how about the horizontal coordination? I think I can lay a bit, maybe that's why. Oh, I, no worries. I yeah, know. horizontal is just across the uh, national um, so basically just what you would uh, imagine it to be. So horizontal coordination would be across the same levels of government. Mm -hmm. so how would we ensure that uh, we would have better coordinated mechanisms? And in your countries, uh, are there any sort of um, coordination such as horizontal or vertical uh, that are implemented so that we can achieve the SDGs? And um, how functional do you think this is? So everyone has can have a can talk about his own country, I guess. About the first question, right? Are we starting, right? Yes, we are. And you can also call on people. I think that's the best way yeah. to engage everyone. Mm. So I will start with Weebi. Uh, Weebi Alpha, Ida. Can you talk about like the coordinative mechanism uh, to implement your uh, the SDG goals in, in Indonesia? If we can help. Is Ida here? Yes, Antoine. Uh, uh... Exactly, I don't know uh, what's going on uh, with SDGs in my country. <laughs> Maybe the, the others first. So, but you can, uh, do, do you have uh, this uh, SDG uh, coordination or the project or about SDG in Indonesia, right? Maybe. Maybe I, I can uh, Googling first. <laughs> I'm sorry, Andran. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's go about the DG. DG, can you hear me? Oh, Andran. Can, yes, can me? you talk about uh, the, the mechanism you use uh, to implement the FDG in? Uh, okay. okay, so actually, I also don't know much about this SDG, but I just think a little bit. So in my country, in Indonesia, like I read that there are uh, about uh, nine, 94, 94 uh, indicators out of 241 indicators in SDGs that are already aligned with in the national uh, planning. So. I think it's, yeah, that's all about the SDGs progress. And for about the 
coordinative mechanism. I'm not sure about this. I, I mean, um, how the collaboration, uh, how the coordination work between our, our institution in in oh. in dealing with a disease in Indonesia. So I, I, I'm not quite sure, Anton. Okay. Uh, who is Anita? Anita is here. Can she hear me? Uh, can I ask Anita Anna? Anna Afiok is here. Can she hear me? Batibaya, can you can you talk a little about uh, the mechanism you use in, in your country? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, Buggy, go ahead. Yeah, what I know is about the, the, the sustainable development in my country. Is, uh, in the last year, the Mongolian government just approved some the long-term planning that's about how to develop the economic, education, and national across the country for the equity for the each civilization in my country. So sorry, it, sorry, I didn't hear you. Sorry, Peggy. Hello. Yes, I could not hear you very well. What did you is say? there something problem under my microphone? No, no, no. I can hear you now. You can um, can tell us. Is it clear now? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. What I know is about my country. So in the last year, our parliament just approved some the long-term planning for the sustainable mm -hmm. development across the whole country that ensured the whole, uh, regarding them, some sectors, what I know is about the education, economic, and some other some other sectors, it should be covered in the, this, uh, the long term planning. And let me check the, some documents here. Yeah, this uh, planning is called the Vision 2050 Long Term Development Policy of the Mongolia. How many? How many? Wish, Vision 2050. Uh. The, its name, Vision 2050, Long-Term Development Policy of Mongolia. So the Mongolia shall become a leading Asian country in terms of the social development and economic growth and citizen quality life. It's the main objective of the, this, the development policy. So there is some goals and subsidiary. The first is shared national value. It means the so this is a kind of approach to integrate the whole of the population entire the country. The next, okay. there is a, some, yeah, I don't know the much detail about it, but that, I just read in the, some, the materials about it. So what, uh, do you, what do you think they are the challenges do you have to, to, to coordinate this plan and, and this uh, long-term uh, planning you have? What are the, the challenges you think they are in your country? The challenges, of course, there are so many kind of challenges. So first, the, the Mongolia is one of the, the just, just developing country in the Asia. That means that the people are facing the so many, maybe different challenges, like uh, especially there is some the differentiation between the people living because, for example, in the in the, the capital city, they tend to have a lot of opportunity. In the rural area, maybe the people cannot catch a lot of opportunity like the, the people. This kind of the differentiation in the, depends on the areas people living. It could be also one challenge. The, as I know, the, the, some, the objective to develop the, the ICT infrastructure whole country. 
But Mongolia is the, one of the widely the geographical location country. That means it's very difficult to reach the, some the rural areas, the infrastructure. Then the, the people living in this, some the remote area, they cannot reach the, the high speed internet or can, they cannot catch the, the information in, in it immediately maybe. They, they, they delete the information reach maybe. This kind of challenge may be very obvious for them. But as I know that there is a, some stages to overcome the, the challenge. First, the, they just the, a pro, the, they're going to have some much detail, the planning. Then maybe they just uh, collect some funding and just implementing this kind of the, the stage, the outgoing is still initiating, but it's so early stage, I, I guess. Okay. So can you talk about the third question? What about can you third question? Yeah, yeah. The government in line the national In the government line, national uh, Let me see, let me let me read the, some the articles about this because I don't have information about this now. Did you have you got some information maybe about the challenges you have in Indonesia? What is it, Anton? Uh, can you like uh, tell about the challenges you see uh, to to achieve the the goals of SDGs in your country? I, I believe uh, Indonesia is working on it. Like there are some specific institution called um, Ministry of Na Ministry of National Development that are I think in charge of this SDGs roadmap in Indonesia and that in I read that in the some of the, their document that uh, uh, maybe I can share the document it's English but I don't really understand I don't really know all about this kind of thing hey, for example do you, do you know the like some of the FDG goals maybe FDG goals in the 17th course. Like, uh, for example, yeah, what are the challenges do you see maybe to, to eradicate poverty in your country? You mean in my opinion, not, not in the yeah, way in it's already opinion. implemented, right? Hmm. Maybe for coordination, I think it will be the hardest part because hmm. uh, in Indonesia we have like uh, maybe 500 cities is it correct really oh, indonesia have like more more than 500 cities so i think it will be need co um, better collaborative action like this this un poc uh, proposed like this toolkit but in reality or in the implementation i don't know how uh, how this thing is work already but I think it this this is this is the biggest challenge in Indonesia about the collaboration. So it is in, yeah, in horizontal coordination. But yeah, so in in horizontal coordination we have uh, like five hundred uh, cities or states, and also maybe in vertical I'm not sure, but I think in the bureaucratics or in the government we have also a quite a quite a long uh, vertical, how to say, vertical coordination. What can maybe, you recommend your partner? Maybe I would like to, yeah, I'd like to know, uh, Antoine, like, uh, like for, I don't know who, who's here that already knows some, some problem about this, maybe they can share, like what is, what is uh, this? like the coordination me mechanisms we can we can have some uh some thought about our country 
maybe anyone can share. Ahmed, Ahmed, can you share a little bit about uh, the question we have here about the discussion? Can Ahmed hear? Uh, good morning, this is Alka Bharat. Uh, can you please hear me? Uh, yes, 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 we hear you. Uh, uh, is... what, where are you from? I'm from India. India? You are in India now? Yeah. Okay. I, so I just, can you... Sorry, okay. sorry. I just want to introduce one uh, term and then I think that weights a lot is diversity. Uh, mm -hmm. That is always a challenge. Uh, diversity, diversity in terms of uh, uh, the territorial, uh, diversity in terms of uh, resources, that is human resources skills. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so it becomes very difficult to have one size fits all model to get into the exercise and once we try to have a different uh, ways of handling at different level then again it is so enormous how like in India we have 28 states we have eight union territories then within states, we have so many districts. Within districts, we have so many urban and rural areas. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so just trying to address SDG, I think uh, there is a, not a very proper connect between where it is conceptualized and where is the action level. So, so when we get into the grassroots, grassroot, that is the level where it has actions. So at times you, you do not have same, same challenges. You do not have uh, same concerns even uh, for the same SDG. That is, I think that is what uh, I just, uh, wanted to raise this and if somebody can address to this, I think that will be good for uh, the global audience. Uh, but Baya, can I ask you again a question? Uh, yes. Uh, can you give us any recommendation to your government so that uh, they can achieve exactly the to improve this coordination? I mean, the last question. Uh, it's a very difficult part. <laughs> Should we discuss it or just... You want yeah, to you can give us any opinion you have. Mm, let me think for it. So I just read uh, some some articles about uh, my country, the sustainable development, which is aimed to develop the whole country until the 2050. So they said that it's kind of the the it should be some cooperation between the government and uh, the private sectors. So mm. the main the challenge is, uh, for example, in my country, the living. The, 
I have to say it. They say they make it lead some stages based on the current this current uh, development stage. First, they need to they establish the, some the small planning until within the ten year. They plan it everything by the ten years, then make it small stages. So the another thing is to to provide the whole the objectives about that is uh, the planning to the whole country. I mean the whole everybody in the country should have information, the same information. I think the. Time is almost over, maybe? Hmm? Yes, uh, we have around a minute left. So I think we yeah. should be wrapping up, but I think we addressed a lot of the key points. Um, I believe that there were several um, country cases in which uh, you mentioned that there was an um, inequity in the sharing of information. And I think um, Alka also mentioned something very important about how there, the diversity, especially in geographic or resource or political difference um, can amount to uh, some fragmentation in, in, in SDG implementation. And I think that's a very uh, crucial point that we have to address. And perhaps our uh, session two speakers will also address and, and try to um, provide some recommendations as to how to um, fix this issue. So thank you so much. And thank you, Antoine, for uh, being the group leader. I think you were excellent. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Can you hear Hello. me? Good afternoon, yes. Yeah, okay. So uh, I'm Pravin Maharzan again. Uh, it's really nice to see you guys in this group discussion. Uh, <clears throat> So we have uh, four questions. Uh, uh, okay, let me share my screen. Okay, yeah, here, here, it, here we go. So uh, I would like to we'll we'll, we'll discuss these four questions. Uh, we can go uh, one by one, and uh, we can cross. Uh, you know, we can discuss these questions. Everyone who is uh, uh, who can answer this question is uh, yeah. We, everyone can answer. So. So what are the first question? What are the coordinating mechanism like such as vertical and horizontal co coordination in your country for implementing the SDGs and how functional is this mechanism? Uh, I would like to ask uh, one of you to uh, be a group leader so that you know uh, we can invite you to the plenary session. Uh, I think um, Meron can be the group leader. Absolutely not. Thank uh, you for having me. What about uh, Mr. Kasuhan? Uh, I can't. Okay. Uh, what about Mr. Jules? Sorry, now I am a little sick for my. Okay. So we have only one, uh, Mr. Aviot. If you can uh, be a group leader, or uh, so we can just. You can, uh, when you go to the plenary session, you can just discuss, uh, you can just tell them uh, what we have discussed. Yes, okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. yeah I have uh, another commitment uh, after this with. Uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll find someone then. Okay. No problem. So, um, but we can discuss this one. Uh, <clears throat> so from uh, Kasuan. So is there any like coordinating, coordinating mechanism for the vertical and horizontal co coordination in a country for implementing the SDGs? Uh, your mic is muted. Yeah, for, for, for me actually, uh... I'm not yet sure uh, about the mechanisms. 
Uh, I am uh, new to the, the domain about this. Uh, so I have less awareness on this issue. That's why. Okay. Uh, then, uh, Mr. Abiyut, uh, can you uh, give your uh, country case on this one? Okay, uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm happy uh, to be here. Um, so, uh, uh, actually, I've been working in the e-government areas for uh, a long time. Uh, so, one of the coordinating mechanisms uh, uh, in implementing the SDGs is to have, uh, for example, in our case, we have uh, a national coordination body uh, for SDGs. It's uh, actually the planning commission. Uh, so usually the planning commission will come up with thematic areas uh, mm -hmm. and give uh, that thematic area to the line ministries and the line ministries uh, will prepare their plan and uh, give back to the planning commission and uh, finally, during the implementation, they will uh, uh, stop it here. The video is lagging now. Yeah, the connection of the uh, video. Uh, okay, uh, then before, maybe we can move to uh, George. Yes, uh, I think that in the case of my country, Ecuador, uh, we don't have a strong coordinative mechanisms for implementing the sustainable development goals. So uh, I think that this... Uh, weakness of my country related to, to that. The, okay. lack of, the lack of an effective coordinative mechanisms. Lack of effective coordination mechanism, okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, we'll go to uh, Mr. Abiot again. Uh, you're talking about planning commission and uh, they sent to the line ministries and they again uh, line ministries in the thematic issues to planning commission so uh, can you please uh, elaborate one more time yes uh, it, it is the way they, they coordinate the planning activities uh, uh, throughout uh, actually uh, um, there are national agendas on each national agenda the line ministry will have its own plan and there will be a joint uh, monitoring and uh, evaluation uh, sessions but in relation to the whole of uh, government, especially with uh, e-government one, uh, we have been trying to have uh, national uh, e-government strategies, but because of uh, various reasons, um, we are unable to implement that one effectively. So uh, as a result, there, will be, there are a lot of uh, silos of application uh, here and there. Uh, one of the challenges for uh, yeah. having such a type of uh, problem is that unless you coordinate the budget itself, the financial resources, uh, it's almost impossible uh, to control uh, others because sometimes if you are controlling the IT or digital projects, some of the projects will come by another name and finally you'll discover them uh, after they are already implemented. So this will create uh, a lot of problems. So. Uh, usually, unless there is a national consensus at the country level, it's difficult to implement all of government uh, uh, as a lower level. Thank you. So you mean uh, there is a budget coordination problem? Yes, there is coordination problem. Yeah. And uh, in your country, uh, sorry, I forget to ask you, uh, which country are you from? I, I'm from Ethiopia. Ethiopia, okay, yeah. So we have two parts. So uh, and to, for this coordination, coordinative mechanism, uh, do you also involve local government? Yeah, yes. Uh, actually, uh, um, uh, we involve uh, local government. Uh, le le let me explain uh, a little bit uh, about my, my background. Uh, I was a former student of uh, 
ITTP, uh, the uh, at KAIST. Uh, now, uh, after I come back here, uh, I led the e-government uh, directorate director here. Uh, so usually we have the national e-government uh, strategy. So according to this strategy, we implement national projects. Usually we involve uh, local governments in uh, building uh, local infrastructures uh, and also uh, regional portals. We usually give them uh, training uh, and other capacity buildings so that they can implement uh, by, by their own. So, but the coordination mechanism is there, but the challenge is uh, the resources uh, assigned for the uh, digital project is uh, very limited. Uh, so uh, it's difficult to, to share uh, that limited uh, resources to, uh, to local uh, government. So most of the projects are implemented as based on availability of resources. Uh, so, uh, and uh, sometimes while we are looking for resources, uh, we have to take interests of donors sometimes. So this will also affect the coordination activities there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for your answer. Actually, yeah, the, uh, from your discussion, from the discussion I, that uh, you involved, there is a coordination mechanism, but still there are some challenges like resource assignment or resource. Uh, and uh, uh, you, if you ask donor, then there is an interest of donor also need to be included in that coordination mechanism. Yeah. So now uh, uh, I would like to ask Mehron from Ethiopia again, uh, if, if she has uh, any, you know, uh, different ideas or different uh, things from the perspective? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, a little bit more on uh, the challenge. Uh, I think it's because the SDG agendas, uh, like Mr. Rabiot said, the SDG agendas are only known on the top level management, like the National Planning Commission and like only the Minister, plan the Planning Committee only. But when it comes down to like, departments or pe personal, like people, individual people, I don't think uh, the HDG plans are really well integrated with individual plans. Maybe that is why um, the SDGs implementation are really going slowly. But it is uh, as a in as a country in Ethiopia, it is uh, integrated in our plans, but. To just select them uh, individually is kind of really um, difficult. I think that's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's not Okay, uh, so in the, like, um, as you mentioned, there is a challenges of coordination, like uh, only on the top level, they know about the SDG agenda. So in your country, uh, like in some countries, there are, you know, their national development plan are aligned to uh, SDG agenda. So is there any, uh, those kind of uh, thing in your country? Oh, yes, it is aligned actually. Uh, our national plans and our personally, like I work uh, in a branch, uh, like in affiliation of uh, the science and technology ministry. Uh, we have the national, the SDGs integrated in our plan, in our ministry plan. Uh, but like I said, when it comes to our individual and department plan, it's more of our ministry plans, like uh, not the SDG plans. But on top level, uh, mm. I know that the ministry uh, plan and uh, is incorporated with the SDG plans, especially from the developing countries side. Uh, I think it is well integrated. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But the problem is... Uh integrating in the department level and maybe individual level or uh, yeah. even yes. the local level? So separating them into really SDGs and our plan is kind of a little bit uh, hmm. difficult, I think. Okay. And uh, what about yours in your country? Uh, so uh, your government has aligned SDGs into uh, your national development planning. Yes, in my country, my country, my, the central government is aligned to the uh, sustainable development goals, but the perception of the citizens and 
maybe another actors, is that the plans for the sustainable development goals are isolated. That means just the central government thinks on the sustainable development goals and the participation of local governments or citizens uh, are not uh, present. I mean, just the central government is thinking on that and exclude the local governments and the citizens on that. And um, for the final implementation, uh, it's just uh, like lo launch orders to citizens or to uh, local governments to do uh, that the main government, the central government is uh, has to do, not more. So uh, the perception from the, the public servant is the lack of coordination and the lack of participation from uh, the central government and local governments and citizens. Yeah. So then, uh, like you almost answer all the questions, like the all three questions, the challenges and the, you know aligning national and uh, sectoral strategies to SDGs. Uh, mm -hmm. But so maybe we can talk about some like suggestions or recommendation to improve the whole of government coordination. Uh, maybe uh, Kasuhan, you can start like, what might be the suggestion or uh, recommendation? Uh, yeah, in this case, I can I can reflect now. Yeah, in, in my view, just I'm also from Ethiopia, by the way. Okay, and, uh, I'm, I, I was working for the, uh, in the university as a professor. So just, when I see the, especially the vertical one, there is a big challenge in creating awareness because uh, I myself see in the, at the higher level, in the ministry levels, they actually have such a thing, but at lower level, vertically, the, the regional levels. So things are, of course, uh, not at the practical level. So uh, I guess one of the things that we need to do maybe uh, Focusing on awareness creation, uh, maybe giving a kind of training and um, maybe cascading these SDG activities to to the vertical the down level to the uh, regionals and uh, maybe the cities, so that uh, they can sum up to the whole government level. Okay, uh, so for the vertical coordination challenge, if I may uh, repeat, so we need the vertical coordination to be aligned with uh, all the like from national to local. Exactly, yeah. So how, how can we do that? Sorry, I could not uh, consider. The, how the, can the first, we, yeah. The, the main idea that I raised is uh, giving due emphasis in especially uh, mobilizing resource as Abiyot mentioned earlier and uh, creating awareness, mainly awareness giving uh, maybe uh, trainings uh, to uh, uh, maybe regional levels and uh, uh, from the national level, I mean, so, so that uh, they can have uh, maybe like similar level of awareness so that they can coordinate the, this uh, issue. Thank you. Uh, what about uh, George, uh, what suggestion or recommendation would you put uh, propose for improving this whole of government uh, coordination? Yes, for my perspective, I can recommend that it could be good to implement a two-way communication, not just one way, two-way communication. So also to include a, a proper organization that are in charge for coordinating all the two-way communications between all the actors. Uh, yeah, so that, I think that could be a, a recommendation. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Abiyot, uh, maybe you have more experience. Uh, so I would like to request you to give some like uh, suggestion or recommendation for improving whole of government approach. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, to improve uh, the whole of government approach, uh, the first thing is to have uh, a clear strategy uh, uh, on 
on the implementation uh, practices. Unless you have a unifying strategy, common strategy, it's difficult uh, to make things to be coordinated at the uh, lower level. Uh, the next one is to have the technical standards. So in, in, in actual implementation, uh, uh, you cannot guide every project. But once you have a technical guideline as a top, and if you convince others to follow that technical guideline, then uh, you will uh, you can uh, coordinate uh, projects, even if uh, you don't have uh, direct control uh, uh, over it. Uh, so, uh, especially in uh, devolving uh, the structure uh, to the regions, uh, in a country like Ethiopia, it is sometimes difficult because we have uh, a strong federated uh, country, which every local government has its own autonomy. Uh, you cannot have uh, a national plan and ask the regions to implement immediately. So you need to have a uh, negotiation and you need to show them the benefit of uh, doing uh, say type of things. So continuous dialogue among the main stakeholders and also uh, showing the benefit of uh, having the whole of government approach to regions is, must be uh, clear. Thank you. Thank you, Abiyat. Uh, I, uh, I I actually don't have anything to, more uh, to add uh, than uh, Kassan and Mr. Abiyot said because we do, we're from the same country. Yes. So yeah, um, I believe that uh, create uh, awareness creation and also continuous monitoring and evaluation uh, will make us uh, step further along uh, SDG class. Okay. So uh, while I was uh, presenting, like uh, when, while I was reading this uh, VNR reports, there are lots of, uh, you know, at the national level, they have um, this whole of government uh, approach in principle. But while, while when they come in this, uh, you know, local level, especially at the grassroots level, there's a big challenge. It's even uh, they, they don't know about the SDGs. They don't know about uh, what's going on. So uh, like one question I wanted to ask, like how can local government be involved in the national government, uh, the dialogue or communication or something like that? Anyone? Like we, we heard about two-way communication and uh, you know devolving the structure continuous dialogue, but uh, is there any like specific action to include the local government because they are the main uh, actor in implementing the SDGs. Without them, I don't think, uh, uh, you know, uh, we can do, uh, we can achieve the SDGs by the this decade of action. So is there any like, uh, we have only a few minutes, so maybe uh, some concrete example of how we can include local government. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, let me respond it. Uh, recently, we have the National Digital Transformation Strategy. That strategy uh, will set the major digital projects to be implemented in Ethiopia for the next five years. So uh, we usually invite regional uh, governments uh, to discuss on, uh, on the national plan. We also encourage them to develop their own based on the national plan. Now we are working with uh, regional governments, especially on, with the city governments. Uh, actually, uh, uh, here in Ethiopia, the regional governments are the states and inside the states there are uh, city governments. We are also working with the city government. We provide them capacity building. Uh, we exchange a uh, template for uh, portal development and other things. So we, we have uh, actually a sort of consortium to, uh, uh, to discuss on say type of issues. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your you know, uh, insightful comments. So you invite local uh, regional government for discussion on national plan. Uh, national digital transformation strategies, and you also encourage them to develop their own uh, strategy also. 
and you also provide capacity deployment for the regional government. Uh, okay. Uh, thank Maybe you very for, much. For complementing, yeah. could be the, to create an open e-government platform. Uh, okay, open creating open e-government e platform. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm CD1. I just uh, would like to share the uh, uh, SDG, SDG development in Thailand, just a, a few okay. seconds. Uh, yes, sure. In Thailand, we set up the, the 20 years national plan, which is rely on SDG. So in 20 years, that means SDG will continue uh, development in Thailand and will not stop. So what uh, is mechanism that uh, we brought uh, the local government to do is we, we use the budget uh, mechanism. Yeah. So that means if a local government don't do uh, any project or something uh, uh, rely on uh, national development, so they will not uh, approve for the budget year. So this is a kind of mechanism that we use. Yeah. Okay. And uh, to that, set up and clearly yeah. for the roadmap for the long, long development like 20 years plan is uh, much more efficient for, for the developing country. I think I, I just would like to share this. Okay, then uh, I would like to ask one question to you. Then how uh, in the 20 year national development plan, how do you engage all the government, like all of government approach? Actually, there are for the seven, 17 pillar from SDG, right? right. Uh, all, all the set up in the, uh, in the national strategy. And then we assign the uh, government authority to, uh, to take care in each the pillar from SDG. Yes. This is uh, also our, our uh, national vision, also uh, uh, efficiency uh, development and sustainable development. So that means it's uh, also the same as the, the um, uh, SDG goal. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now uh, we are going back to the plenary session again. Uh, we can leave this breakout session. Thank you. Number three, uh, here, as Robin has just kindly uh, shared with us, he would like us to nominate one group leader and perhaps one rapporteur so that if we wish to, um, we can present during the plenary after this session. So during this breakout group session, we will like to discuss or share some, um, share each other's experience uh, based on the presentation we just heard from Mr. Pukin Shim and Pavin Maharjan. Uh, Alida, could you kindly show on the screen the question? Thank you. So here is the group discussion. The first one is, uh, I'll actually read all four of them and the group leader can decide um, which question you would like to address first. So let me just first read all the questions. What are the coordinative mechanisms such as vertical and horizontal coordination in your country for implementing the SDGs? How functional is this mechanism? Next, what are the main challenges in this vertical and horizontal coordination? And how is your country addressing these challenges? Next, is your government aligning its national or sectoral oral strategies to the SDGs and setting whole of government plans for implementation at the domestic and international levels. And then next, what suggestions or recommendations would you propose for improving whole of government coordination? So any volunteers for the group leader? Um, you, you can also introduce yourself before you speak, which country you represent, uh, and which government ministry you come from. Um, any, any volunteers? Hello. Hi, Tahir. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Tahir Sadiq. Uh, I am from Pakistan I, and I am representing my country uh, of, for this uh, workshop uh, arranged by the United Nations. And that's it. Do you, would you like to be the group leader for this discussion? 
Uh, I think somebody else can uh, manage the best. All right, then, Tahir, um, would you, is there any of these, are these, any of these questions relevant to you um, as you work in Pakistan? Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, with respect to first question, what are the coordinative mechanism, vertical or horizontal coordination in, in our country for implementing the SDGs? Uh, particularly, uh, our government uh, has made an horizontal coordination uh, at lower level, uh, like uh, local government, uh, and social uh, departments uh, to coordinate and uh, make uh, the function, functions of SDGs and to implement the SDGs in our country. Uh, through that uh, horizontal coordination system, we are uh, achieving our goals and uh, working towards the uh, mission and implementing the SDGs at our best. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, next, uh, since I do not see anyone volunteering uh, through either through chat or through raising their hand, I'll just call on um, each of your names if that's okay. Um, so Mohammad Mubarakut, I see you. Would you like to continue the discussion? Um, which uh, first introduce yourself and if you would like to answer any of these questions, um, you're welcome to do so. Okay, thanks so much for uh, this nice uh, discussion. So uh, my name is Mohammed. I am from Ministry of Telecommunication in Yemen. And uh, my uh, point of interest is this whole of government approach. Uh, what I feel at, uh, like happening in my country is so uh, like uh, we are, everybody is working in silos. So which eventually uh, exhaust all your resources and uh, this lack of integration is, uh, is, is still problematic. But I think also one of the challenges in the whole of government is the uh, resolving this conflict of uh, among stakeholders at different levels. So uh, it's a challenging task, but uh, so uh, maybe the framework proposed is looks good, but I don't know how uh, sometimes it should fit uh, to a country specific context. Sometimes some amendments or changes needed. And yeah, that's uh, what I can uh, share. Maybe also my friends can add something. Yes, thank you for sharing. Uh, next, Agus Arimbawa, if I'm sorry for butchering your name. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. My name is Agus Arimbawa. I came from Indonesia. And in, back in Indonesia, I was a... Um, an, a university lecturer, uh, an assistant professor. So in my domain, this not much related to SDG, but uh, uh, I think that uh, in Indonesia, like uh, maybe in other developing country, I uh, was still going there. Uh, we're still working as much as we could to have uh, coordinations are among vertical or also horizontal uh, but um, we, we need a lot of work to do uh, but in that regard maybe I cannot talk much but uh, I think uh, there there is a way to do that uh, and I think this uh, tool uh, it will be helpful for us. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Agus. Uh, next is Zubeda. Uh, 
Hello everyone. My name is Zubeda. I am from Tanzania. Uh, I'm working for Public Service Commission as ICT officer. Um, my knowledge on how my government implemented SDGs is little low, but uh, I think uh, for uh, as I know, we implement in sectoral strategies. Uh, maybe for agriculture, we have different strategies for agriculture. And then we have a national level for all sectors. But I think we need more time and to set more strategies to implement SDG in my country. Okay, thank you for sharing, Zubeda. Um, next, may I call upon Aisha Akram? So, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm Aisha from Pakistan and working as assistant director in Ministry of Overseas Pakistan. As far as Pakistani government situation is concerned, we are facing challenges in like uh, democracy stability, political stability, and defense related issues. But I think uh, implementation of SDGs in the country will help to counter these challenges. Currently, the government is working uh, on the implementation of SDGs, but still we are facing some difficulties due to uh, political instability. Once the government changed, the next government not on the policies of previous government. Thank you for sharing, Aisha. So we have two Pakistanis in our group uh, as we just met Tahir and now Aisha. Okay, so next, uh, I would like to call upon Leonard Chan. Hi, Leonard, can't hear you because you're muted. But um, if you're not there, then let me move on to Molina Kappa. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. So I, I have a um, speech impairment. So um, let me know if you can't hear me. I can't speak properly. Uh, I'm from uh, PNG, I'm from Papua New Guinea. Um, I work as a principal ICT engineer with the ICT authority in my country. Um, regarding those questions uh, for discussions, unfortunately, uh, to my knowledge, um, we haven't been really successful in getting a more collaborative kind of approach to implementing the SDGs. Um, most of the governments uh, are working in silos, and I mean, they're starting from the national government to the provincial and to the local government. So uh, it's a bit difficult uh, to implement the SDGs, but um, the good thing is recently I've noticed the government uh, at the highest level, that's the national government, uh, taking into consideration their uh, specific area or specific ministerial policies incorporating the SDG. So um, I think looking uh, forward, uh, I would like to say probably we will, um, when, when the leaders meet together, this is something positive for the country. So I am more open minded to seeing a lot of improvements in achieving or working towards the SDGs in our country. So thank you. 
Thank you for sharing, Melina, uh, from Papua New Guinea. I think that's what I heard. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Good. Uh, next, let me call upon Lisa Bell Ramos. Hi, I just came in late, but I hope I, I am trying, well, I'm trying to understand what should be done, but I understand that we have to provide some inputs based on our local experiences regarding the questions, right? Sure. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm basically representing the local government, and um, I'm um, currently affiliated with the Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Office of a local government in the Philippines. So in our case, um, the, the monitoring, for instance, or the implementation of the SDGs, for instance, are actually taken care of by our planning office. So they are the ones in charge of making sure that all of the departments mainstreamed SDGs in their, um, um, in their mandate or in their programs. And then we usually do um, regular reporting to our planning office. And the planning office now is in charge of reporting it to the regional office. And then the regional office is in charge of reporting it to the national office. So that's how the coordination um, works, um, at least in the Philippines. Um, in terms of um, aligning st sectoral strategies to the SDGs, um, I think for this part, we do it on a per department, um, per department or per office um, basis first. And then per office will each office has their um, respective membership to a specific sector. So, for instance, the Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Office is under the protective sector of the city government. And so, the protective sector now will pull all of their um, SDG strategies that will be reported to the um, city government in general. Um, and in terms of the approach, it's more or less based on the department's discretion. Um, well, unfortunately, well, at least in my, in my perspective, since again, I'm in the Disaster Reduction and Management Office and we're not really directly reporting to the regional or national office in charge of monitoring STG implementation in the country, but at least in my observation, there has been very limited capacity building by the national government to the local governments in terms of, you know, understanding what has been the, what has been the commitment of the national government of the, the Philippines in general, um, and how can we now align at the local level our programs and strategies? So what usually happens is that um, we at the local government, and specifically per office, comes up with our own strategies, comes up with our own implementing uh, mechanisms, and that now, um, and now it is the planning offices. Um, responsibility to collate and process and 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 um at least see the progress of the whole city in general so that's how how it basically works in um in our country at least on how i understand it uh being done thank you thank you very much for sharing uh your experience uh in your local government in the philippines um, and you specifically work for the DRR sec section, the sec, uh, yeah. Uh, next, let me call upon Yan Mio Ang, who is our last uh, participant in this group. Yan. Okay, um, we are unable to hear Jan. Um, let's see how much time we have left. Does anybody else want to address the other questions such as um, what suggestions or recommendations would you propose for improving whole of government coordination? Because we did hear some of the challenges and we did hear that 
Um, in some countries, they don't have this whole of government coordination or this coordinative mechanisms. We heard that one country, they work in silos. We heard that another country, um, democratic and political stability is, is the bigger challenge. So does anyone want to share um, some suggestions or recommendations for improving the whole of government coordination? For instance, just now we heard from Philippines that uh, there is little capacity development from the national to the local level. So one recommendation would be uh, to, for the national government to provide capacity development to the, at, the uh, at the local level, to the local government officials. That might be one suggestion. Uh, does anybody else have any suggestions or recommendations? Well, this is again Liza from the Philippines. And just to also build up on that on that recommendation, I think we can also expand um, the capacity building activities to the civil society organizations and the private sector. Um, here in the Philippines, our private sector has actually a very strong, um, if I may say, a very strong influence. Um, particular, especially particularly to disasters reduction and management because we have this private arm called the Philippine Disaster Resilience Foundation. And I think maybe through them, because they have this member city, a member private um, organizations, then, they, then maybe the national gov government can also look at that. And maybe for other countries, they can also look at, you know, um, coming up or convening their private sector or their civil society organizations and come up with... Um, maybe a learning peer to peer learning exchange or um, some some form of capacity building very good peer to peer exchange and also engaging the private sector and civil society organizations uh, aisha would you like to chip in uh, i agree with my colleague and the participant uh, uh, speaking, okay, we have to set priority, priority of the programs, uh, like we must invest in education sector and the health sector. Once the one uh, uh, I'm healthy and I'm educated, then I can play a good role for the development in of my country. So the local, so the national government must uh, uh, to hand over the authority and responsibility and assets to the go local government so they may strengthen the education sector and the health sector at the local level. And once I get all the facilities, I can actively participate in the development of other goals and about the welfare of my society. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your suggestion. Uh, all right, so uh, anybody else? Maybe Mohammed? just one, one point to add. Uh, because like even in my country, you have a lot of this capacity building. And uh, I agree, it's very important. But sometimes uh, what comes after capacity building, like are we really re reflecting these things and uh, aligning them at our national and local government? with regard to, to either SDG or the whole of government or whatever strategy we have. So that's another issue. And sometimes uh, uh, like uh, uh, realizing these capacity building programs in our, uh, in the real world is, is uh, I think it's, it's totally different story. And uh, maybe this is where we can spot the problem maybe here, especially in public sector organizations. So uh, yeah, we have to look at it from a, like a portfolio uh, level uh, when it comes to this the whole of government and the, uh, check how can we end up uh, reflecting those uh, programs and capacity buildings and these solutions introduced into our real uh, uh, institutional level and uh, local government level. Thanks. Thank you very much. So you highlighted that, um, yes, we do have 
many capacity building activities, but uh, the, your suggestion would be to go to the next step of institutionalizing the follow up of the outcomes of all of these capacity building that it doesn't just stay as one time event, but then there's a follow up um, to the lessons learned from these capacity building and that that should be institutionalized um, in order to be effective and have impact. Um, okay, so we have one minute left. They may give us some time to present during the plenary. Who wants to volunteer to present? Mohammed, Aisha, um, and then there was this other colleague from the Philippines. <laughs> Lisa, so if if they if we do have an opportunity, group three, who wants to represent group three? Aisha, I see your hand. Good. See you later. We're going back to the plenary. Uh I agree to present, but uh, can you please guide me <laughs> to present? So, maybe, so you, you can follow suit. Let's see how other groups present, but it would be kind of like a summary. You can say, you know, I met Yemen, Philippines, Tanzania, Indonesia, and we talked about these challenges and we came up with these suggestions. Is that okay? like some of the challenges that you have mentioned from Pakistani perspective. Oh, we, there was also a Papua New Guinea participant here with us. Um, and, you know, Mohammed mentioned in Yemen, a lot of uh, their approaches in silos. So we have 10 seconds. Do you get it, Aisha? If, if you have an opportunity, if you don't have an opportunity, maybe tomorrow um, you'll have an opportunity to present. Uh, my name is Wuyang Kim, and I'll be the moderator for this group discussion. Um, and as our staff and colleague, Robin Maharjan, program management expert, has announced, we will be starting this group discussion by first selecting the group leader. Um, but before that, I would like to have a moment for us to uh, shortly introduce ourselves for a more active discussion. So my name is Wu Yang Kim, Administrative Assistant for UNPOG, and I'll be taking um, uh, care of this group discussion. Um, and I was the uh, host for this whole uh, online training workshop, and I'll be guiding you through it. Um, and we also have our two interns who will be helping me out and um, you as well. We have Taeyeon Kwan and Sarah Lim, who is our um, intern. They will be helping us out. They will be taking screenshots here and also taking notes. And not only that, um, um, sharing screens. Um, sorry, is this Sarah or Seon sharing the screen today for this group? Um, Seon is going to share the screen. Okay, Seon, can you kindly um, share the screen of okay. the group discussion, please? Yeah. I think uh, she's working on it, yeah. Thank you. Uh, one second. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, we can see it now. Um, before we begin the group discussion, so as I said, I, I think we can have a brief uh, introduction of ourselves. Uh, like I said, we had two interns who have joined us here and myself, and also we have Professor John Song here as well. Um, Professor Song, would you like to briefly introduce yourself if you would have a moment, please? Hello, nice to see you all um, online. I am 
John Song from Seoul National University. At, uh, I'm Deputy Director of uh, Global Research and Development Business Center. I'm primarily focusing on um, the finding out the sustainability framework to implement the whole SDG into government uh, organizations as well as uh, public and private segments as well. I'm just happy to learn a lot from this workshop. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, so by taking turns, can we have a brief introductory moment, please? Um, Elias, can you briefly introduce yourself, please? And it would be appreciated if you could briefly turn on your video on, if you can, while you are introducing yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Elias Shomba, a Seoul National University PhD candidate, uh, majoring in technology management, economics and policy. I'm very happy to be here today, uh, attending this kind of training. It's very helpful for us as we are all government officials. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have Akla introduce? oneself, please. Um, if it is difficult to turn your video on, it's yeah. also hi. fine hi. to... Oh, uh, Sorry. Hi. Yeah, thank hi, you. Hi. All right. Uh, uh, my name is Ainal Akka. I'm from Malaysia. Uh, I'm running a program to help the community, I mean, the, uh, the social inclusion group, where we run a program uh, for the community to to stand on their own and help each other. And then for the government, like, you know, they have the policy. Uh, so they implement the policy and we are trying from, you know, uh, from the bottom and up. So the government is easy to know what's the problem and they can address it uh, using our program. So that's what we're doing. Thank you. Um. Sorry, I was muted. Um, can we have Hain Lee introduce, please? Hi everyone, this is Hain Lee from Global r and Center. I'm the program coordinator and uh, it's my great pleasure to be invited here and it'll be a great opportunity to see how you guys discuss in certain issues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can we have Kabalisa Rene? Uh, introduce oneself, please. So my apologies. I have a problem with my laptop, so the video cannot switch on. No problem, yeah. My name is Kabalisa Rene. I'm from Africa, Rwanda. I'm doing a PhD in uh, SNU, uh, Technology Management and Economic and Smart City Program. Looking forward to listen to what is happening. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, can we have Marianne Tingui introduce oneself, please? Uh, maybe she's preparing oneself, so maybe we can ask Sonia to introduce oneself first. Uh, maybe we can move on to the next person. Um, uh, I'm not really sure if I can pronounce this correctly. It's same. Why? Can you introduce yourself, please? Maybe we can move on to the last person, uh, Yodit. Can you introduce yourself briefly, please? Okay. Uh, hello, guys. My name is Yodit. Hi. I, uh, hi. <laughs> um, my name is Yodit. I came from Ethiopia, East Africa. 
So I, uh, I am an SNU ITPP student. Thank you so much. Um, actually, my role uh, would end here. Um, I would now like to uh, select the one team leader who can facilitate and introduce these group discussions to our group members um, so that they can uh, share their ideas. Um, well, it would be nice if we could have a volunteer. Um, can somebody kindly uh, step up as a volunteer to take the role of a team leader, please. It's not that difficult. It's just reading out the questions on behalf of all the team and facilitating. If there isn't one, then I would have to randomly select by my own decision. Um, are there any volunteers? Good morning. Oh, hi. Hi. Oh, hi. I think you did not have a chance to introduce yourself, right? Yes. I'm Marian Ntingui. Yeah. I'm Marian Ntingui from Malawi. I'm working under Department of e Government in the midst of uh, information. Thank you so much. I'm here to learn more. Of course, we are doing SDGs. So I want to learn from other countries what they are doing and um, be able to utilize as we are um, implementing our systems here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, so are there no volunteers as a group leader? Um, Elias, can I ask you to kind of take a role? Um, simply, you can um, read out the questions yourself to the team. And um, please ask other colleagues about what they think for each of these questions. OK, I, I can, but I'm using mobile phone. I don't know if there will be any inconvenience, but it's OK. So the procedures will be just reading the questions and then they will respond. That's correct. Okay. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, let's move on now with our questions because here the aim is to share our knowledge experience from our uh, work or from our offices or our countries. Uh, let me just go through uh, the questions. Uh, what are the coordinative mechanisms can either be vertical or horizontal coordination in your country while you are implementing the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. How functional is this mechanism in your country? You can just turn on your mic and you can share with us. Uh, would there be any um, insightful opinions or ideas that you would like to share of your country? If not, I think we can move on to the next question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think maybe I can, I, can, I can share with you something from experience from my country. As I think as, as other countries, we have got the, our, 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 our system, we have got the ministers who hold these ministries and the, each ministry, I should say, uh, the kind of uh, uh, leadership is uh, top down from the minister, going down up to the department and the agencies which belong to that kind of, that ministry. Therefore, uh, 
aligning to the SDGs uh, whenever there are these national issues, normally the ministries are just coordinated by some other members from other ministries in order to align. For example, there's a, let's say, a project which is concerned with the, the infrastructure. It means it will also touch the life of people. Therefore, other ministers who are concerned with that kind of ministry will also be connected to that kind of activity in order to eliminate working in silos. So at least all other ministry will be informed, just uh, sharing. And this also happened the same for some other institutions who are normally the implementers of these policy rules and regulations. They also coordinate, they also share during the activities. Let me, let me move to the second questions. What are the main challenges in this vertical and the horizontal coordination? And how is your country addressing these challenges? Please, let's be free. You can just turn on your, turn on your mic and then you can just share with us your experience, challenges, anything, recommendations. Yes, um, there is no straight wrong and right answer. And this is just uh, an informal discussion where we can share our ideas from our own countries. So please share your thoughts. Uh, can I say something? Sure, thank yes, you. Yes, Rene, welcome. I think, I think we, we from Africa, mostly we are mostly more concerned with SDGs because this is, when you look up on the 23 SDGs, the number of SDGs, we are really back behind. And uh, for the first question, I was trying to figure out what to say, but I think we have this agenda for uh, reaching the SDG goals by 2063, I guess, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we, we have got a kind of platform to implement this, uh, this this uh, these agendas and we have got a lot of stuff we, in Rwanda we have um, we have the, like one ministry that is uh, in charge of kind of implementing this SDG agenda and actually they have got uh, we have also uh, a vision uh, which is called national strategy for transformation but mostly this vision is aligned with the NASH, the SDGs uh, implementation. But mostly for the, sec the second question, the, the, the challenges, the challenges is a lot of, there are a lot of challenges. For example, number one challenge is governance, mostly in, in Africa. Uh, governance, when I talk about governance, is not about uh, maybe dictatorship or so, but it's about, um, performing, how do we perform? We have a lot of SDGs like zero hunger, achieving uh, this and that, but we need a good governance, which is a challenge still for Africa. I don't want to mention any country, but in general. Then number two challenge is human capital development. In order to achieve these goals, we have to have people who are able to, to do things and uh, as we see, in other countries. Uh, so mostly I would say two of the challenges is human capital development and uh, governance, which lacks mostly in African continent. So I will let other people to comment. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rene, for sharing. Hi, uh, Lionel here from Malaysia. Can you hear me? Yes, All right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, to, 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 to answer the question, number one and number two, because uh, in Malaysia, we have like multicultural and everything. So, and then even the, the race, the religion. So it's supposed to be like chaos, but in Malaysia, like most of them, like we are very united. So the government is like, uh, I mean, the ministry is like, should be like really easy how to control Malaysian. 
So what have been done is like, you know, the government is very transparent to what's like, you know, all the informations and then we are helping each other and we have a tagline that everybody is helping each other. And then uh, I think the main challenges that we have in Malaysia is not that much because we have a very good, like, you know, uh, connectivity, uh, uh, you know, we can, you can connect to each other. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, that's not so many challenges, but the thing is about when COVID happened, uh, it, it's very hard for us to reach to the, the one that you no know, living like uh, really in the, in the suburb. So that's the challenges that we're having right now in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, hello. hello. Um, uh, as Malay government, the SDGs, of course, they're being implemented as um, what Elias commented earlier, that we have uh, uh, the cabinet itself with the president on top, and uh, these ministries are attached to departments. And uh, we have PSs in these departments as well as the technical people. Um, the strategies are there and they're made at uh, central government as well as uh, local government. And they're supposed to be trickling down to the rural masses in order for us to move together. But a uh, challenge can be on um, uh, connectivity. If we take this period of COVID, uh, we are working from home most of the times and um, movement is minimal. We cannot have a, a large group, uh, you know, getting together and come up with the uh, issues and uh, resolving them. As a result, it will depend on um, maybe as we have done on Zoom, um, these uh, virtual meetings cannot happen in rural setting because of our connectivity. But uh, if we can have better connectivity, I know that um, most of our African countries are facing that. With better connectivity as you have in Korea, definitely that can improve and we can be able to implement. And uh, I think the other thing is, is has been already mentioned, a human capital, as well as, um, you know, the economy itself also affects. When it comes to retrust rate, we are okay. But um, I think uh, the skills now. Yes, we, we are sorry, we are left with a few minutes. You can summarize it. Yeah, uh, I'm saying that uh, we need maybe specialists in uh, certain areas. Uh, if we have got that, then we can be able to um, succeed in implementing the SDS. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing. I don't know if you have enough time. Let me go to the third question. Is your government aligning its national or sectoral strategies to SDGs and the setting whole of government plans for implementation or at the domestic and international levels? Or what suggestion or recommendation would you propose for improving the whole of government coordination? This kind of strategies of government coordination. Hi, uh, I think I would like, you know, in Malaysia, if we can suggest it, like, you know, a recommendation of a uh, customized government service to be implemented in everywhere, because sometimes maybe in your country, it's like a huge country. So different culture, different language and everything inside in one country. So if the government can implement a a customized uh, government service at each location, that would be best for us to do the SDG. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you very much. I think this is the end of our uh, breakout session. Um, Elias, uh, um, as a moderator, we would have to ask whether the group would like to report back to the plenary with a summary of our discussion. Um, it is not mandatory and is it is in voluntary basis. Would you like to make the summary during the plenary session? Okay, thank you. If, if I got you clearly, just the, the summary of what we shared together. Oh, thank you very much. Then I will let Pravin know. Okay, now we will move back to the plenary. Okay, thank you. Volunteering, so you be our group leader. And uh, 
will you report back or somebody who also want to report back? We could have same person to do that. Just um, train it to the house. Sorry, I didn't get you. No, I'm saying you could still be the reporter to the plenary session. After our discussions, you provide a summary and report Yes, I back. can be. Okay, okay. Fine. Okay, thanks very much. If we all agree, then we progress. Um, do we have uh, our colleague can project the question online so that, yes. So we have to look at four thematic issues because uh, as part of our discussion, we just looked at the um, uh, national to local coordination mechanisms in our countries or the general one that was provided by Prabin and other speakers. So now we want to look at, based on our experience, I know we all have this kinds of uh, perspective from our various uh, organizations and countries. So what are the coordinative mechanisms, whether both vertical or horizontal in your country or organization in implementing the SDGs? We all know the SDGs or the 2030 agenda is a, a global something we want to achieve. So one, two. Sorry, you're muted. Oh no, you're muted. Okay, sorry, sorry. I don't know. I, because the screen kept flipping. So I want to know some of you could answer. We are answering the first one for now. The coordinative mechanism, how is your government coordinate, what was the coordinating mechanism in your country, uh, both local and national, and even at the local level, whether horizontal or vertical in implementing the sustainable development goals. Then by extension, we will look at how functional is it working because uh, there are the level of effectiveness of each of these in various, even in various regions of our countries may differ. So you could share your experience. I think we could make it brief. Maybe my country goes this way or it goes that way, does it? So then we keep the notes and share in the next section. Who is leading the way? Uh, Dana, may I start mm -hmm. with the case? Yes, please, you can proceed. Okay, uh, in the Philippines, we have the national uh, Economic and Development Authority. Uh, okay. It's a cabinet level or, uh, agency, it's interagency. Um, and uh, it is the coordinating, uh, coordinating body for the SDG uh, planning and implementation. Um, and the uh, NEDA, uh, there is a NEDA secretariat and a NEDA uh, policy making body. Uh, the policy making body is headed by the president of the Republic uh, and the NEDA Secretariat is headed by the Secretary General of NEDA, uh, who has a cabinet uh, position or portfolio. Um, uh, below the NEDA are the Regional Development Councils, and below the Regional Development Councils are Local Development Councils, uh, meaning the local government units um, uh, below the, the, the regional level. Um, how functional is this mechanism to the extent that they have uh, 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 opened uh, the, the coordinating council to the private sector and to the civil society organization and to the extent that they are linking with other uh, agencies because it's an interagency. Uh, in addition to interagency, it also links with the private sector and the civil society organizations at the lower level. Um, yeah. it is functional to a certain degree. Okay, thank you, Ms. Mendoza, for such an elaborate um, uh, outline. Uh, I would like to share. Okay, Sorry, yes. I would like to, sh I would like to share experience. I am Masoodi okay. from Pakistan. All right, uh, let's hear from Pakistan. Yeah, uh, the government system in Pakistan is major, uh, few uh, government institutions like defense, health, uh, and social security are centralized controlled, whereas all other departments are provincially controlled, are local government controlled after 18th amendment, which was passed in government of Pakistan. Uh, so the uh, 
major issues we are the employee of uh, social security or old age benefits uh, we make a registration of all of uh, the private sector registered their employees and, and upon their completion of successful uh, qualifying uh, service to uh, pension we award them pensions from federal government and during their service we collect specific amount of contribution from employers and that okay. will be uh, uh, added to a pool pool of amount uh, where that is invested in some other sector and when they got age of 60 for men and 55 for female we award them pensions right that sounds interesting to you bring in a new perspective to this uh, as compared to the philippines structure and especially by highlighting the implementation agencies both for the central control the provincial control yes do we have any other uh, inputs from another colleague i would like to add something more I'm okay. from Ms. the Robin. department and I reside in Pakistan. Okay. We cater the private sector of our country uh, and we provide pensions as described by my respectable colleague. Uh, we have like uh, for government sector, we have separate pension system which cater the government officers and we cater the private whole private sector of our country wherever five or more than five people are are working whether they are working in any shop or any hospital or any other place so this provides a, a like a supportive system when a person gets age, aged and uh, it helps them to go through the tough times uh, during their old age and it helps them a lot it it also covers disability pension widow pension old age pension and uh, we are trying to cover some other areas like uh, people who are uh, working outside of our country and when they come back to our country and uh, they have nothing to support them so we are trying we are trying to make some strategies to cover those people as we get uh, numerous Uh, applications from them who, uh, people who are living overseas and when they come back they do not have any sort of support or pensionary benefits so we are trying to cover that area also so that will also help them to the people okay. who are nationals of our country and living outside our premises for a while right. yeah but mr uh, sorry mr rabin Uh, okay. This is uh, not still applicable in Pakistan. The overseas uh, community is not uh, no, covered I by said, our scheme. No, I said we are considering in our future prospects yeah. this thing, specific thing to cover that. We are trying to make strategies and policies to devise this thing. Okay. Yeah, I think yes. it provides okay. more uh, understanding okay. to that. So okay. do we I have... I, I wanted to... Um, see how this uh, the coordination is done because we want to see these are the roles that are played so how is the coordination done maybe in just one sentence how do you coordinate between these various institutions both at the local and national level in especially in delivering the social security issues uh, you are asking from us yeah pakistan especially yeah okay Uh, you are asking the coordination between provincial government and federal government uh, departments yes that's why right. and linking that with the national level in delivering this uh, social security something yeah exactly very good question i admire it uh, the claimant the person is that who, who will claim his uh, uh, he may have residence in all over pakistan in four major provinces Uh, but the contribution collected will be formulated in a pool of contribution that will be added in during his service he can claim a universal number will be allotted to him that will be known as eobi number and he can claim his pensionary grants or social security benefits all over pakistan wherever he can live uh, suppose he, he has served in quetta and now residing in karachi or lahore he can uh, claim his pensions and old age and benefits uh, in in any 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 city of pakistan 
that is a centralized okay. pool uh, of funds. Yeah, this is the mechanism which works for the claimants in our world, Pakistan. Okay, so it provides how these systems are integrated where people can claim. So I, yeah. whilst we uh, receive other inputs from other colleagues, let's just narrow it down. Whilst we go in, some of the challenges uh, we also encounter in our countries. So if somebody is answering from another country, you can just mention this how it happens and these are the challenges we face so that we progress to the second question. Is somebody having another perspective from their country? I think in other countries, for instance, uh, this coordination mechanism, especially where we have uh, the decentralized system, especially in most developing countries, uh, we have the national level where we have the, um, the ministries or the ministerial yeah. level. Then we have the regional coordinating council. Okay. Uh, I'm from Brazil. Yeah, I'm from okay. Brazil. Okay, let's uh, hear from you. The coordination there is like you're saying, like the presidential has some uh, goals and he puts the goals from the SDGD, the, uh, sorry, SDG. And we have the civil, we call civil house that coordinates and, and, and follow, I mean, uh, Follow if the the goals are are being reached. We okay. but the, the, the president has the ministries and the of course the states has their own uh, power. So it's independent power from the government. Of course, there is some issues of the the Brazil is very huge and and it's two hundred million people, eight eight billion eight million billion, uh, billion square. So. Most of challenges of this coordination is that sometimes the parties are different from the state and the presidential, and it's uh, they divide it as not the same goal. So this is one of the challenges. They sometimes the politics uh, is in the in the way of of which goal is the priority, and that's and so. So you mentioned there are this civil house, there is this ministries, but sometimes the coordination is not well functioning, right? Yeah, because not not in the because there's the state government and the the national government. So the national government is the president of the ministry, and the okay. the civil house is attached to the president. But okay. the 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 government, the mayor, the governance from the states. They have autonomy okay. to, to, to reach the, the, this coordination locally and responsible for the locally. So the, but it's how you say, it's followed by the national, the national wants its results. It gives the, the legislation about it and the, the, the goals about it and, and try to, to collect the data from them. But sometimes it's difficult for because there's a lot of states and the regions are very different. The population and the people also have different, uh, I would say, uh, time for answering, and it's sometimes it's very difficult to coordinate the whole national. All right. Yes. Can I add one thing? All right. Yes. Thank you very much. Continue. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, I would like to add that our newly elected government around three years back or two years back, Mr. Imran Khan, Prime Minister of our, of our country, introduced a Prime Minister a Performance Delivery Unit in which citizens of our country can lodge complaints related to different government departments and they are entertained and they are disseminated to different departments they are pertaining to and they are being monitored and they are being solved. So recently I am being, I am posted there uh, in my, uh, in my institution and I am looking forward that uh, performance delivery portal PMDU, which is called PMDU. And uh, we received a numerous number of uh, complaints there, which are related to our pension uh, then we created three more dashboards which cover 
three different pro uh, provinces of our country and i receive complaints which is central then i sent to respective respective cities uh, and their regional heads they received that complaints which are related to like people are uh, their pension is being delayed or any other they are not satisfied with their uh, pension or they are uh, like they they are getting pension and they are saying that we need uh, increment in that or any other issue they are facing so we say, i sent that particular complaint uh, to that particular area and we get a uh, response uh, allocated of 7 days and we get response and their complaint is resolved within days so this new system uh, introduced in our country has created a evaluation system for government offices to solve the issues of citizens which are being uh, you can say which are being lost in this complaint portal and we are being monitored to whether we are solving their complaints in respective time frame or not okay. we are not entertaining their complaints it is being shown in that window that uh, their complaint gets escalated their complaint is not being internet and they are given option uh, to say whether they are satisfied with our performance or not so this okay. is very one good, good thing which is introduced and we are being monitored and we are being evaluated uh, in terms of our performance and in terms of their opinion and their feedback that whether we are working for their uh, uh, for their betterment or not okay yes thank you for providing such insights too especially on how you are using that to overcome the challenge so we answering this question with the mindset or the idea that all these programs or these institutions or coordination mechanisms in our countries are geared towards achieving the sustainable development goals so if we talking about pensions we talking about implementing some plans that it means is related to either one or more of the sdgs of the 7 17 sdgs so can we still highlight some challenges or move to so how is your government aligning national or sectoral strategies to the sdgs you know we have the 17 sustainable development goals they need to be integrated or aligned to the national or pl national plans have to be uh, aligned to them how is your government aligning this uh, national plans or development agenda with the sdgs and maybe trying to promote this kind of whole of government or whole of society approach especially whole of government approach or sometimes the national plans are sometimes delinked from the sdgs how do we find them in our countries or based on our experience we can share that too Mr. Dana okay uh, yes yeah may i share again the philippine experience but before right. i go to the third question uh, the main challenge of uh, the coordination is basically it's not national centric mm -hmm. and okay, the vertical uh, coordination is that given much attention uh, it looks like that uh, there is a dichotomy uh, that the policy uh, formulation planning and design uh, are functions reserved to the national level and the implementation monitoring uh, uh, sources of uh, evaluation uh, and other information and data are uh, reserved to the local government units now how do how how does our government align the national and sectoral uh, strategies to the sdgs the philippines has an ambition 2040 uh, it's basically a vision uh, of the future and we also have a, a philippine development plan that is revised every 6 years uh, uh, the ambition is uh, until 2040 it's, so it's beyond the 2030 of the sdg Uh, so what the government has been doing is to align the development plan the philippine development plan and the local development plans into the ambition 20, 2040 and the sdg 
And uh, many of the sectoral uh, thrusts and the chapters of the development plan are anchored on the different uh, goals of the SDG. Uh, okay. However, uh, we are good in planning. So we have very good plans, uh, but uh, in terms of the implementation, uh, there is the, uh, that is the source of most of the problems, uh, basically because um, coordination and the actual realities on the ground may not be as ideal as expected. Okay. Thank you. That sounds very good too. And so in the last part, what are some of the ways we could help improve whole of government coordinations in our country based on this lessons learned? I know we have just a few more minutes. So whilst we're doing this, uh, Ms. Rabel, maybe yeah. the idea is to get that to report back if you are prepared to do that. But uh, we can also just look at uh, what are the ways to improve a uh, uh, whole of government approach in our countries, especially looking at some of the challenges you mentioned and those we may know in our context. There are several number of ways if we can pro improve our technology system and integrate in devices system that uh, integrate all the departments with each other. Our, I recently talked about PMDU that has in integrated all our departments to each other. Okay. Whenever we have issues, we uh, send that particular complaint to other department and get that particular complaint resolved. During the time of COVID, uh, one of uh, one poverty elevation program was introduced uh, that was called SAS emergency program uh, that catered the lower income people and the people who were on daily wages. They helped them financially and a system was devised where they were uh, entering their data. A data was gathered of that particular people and they were provided with a facility to enter their in, uh, CNIC number on the given uh, spots and they were provided with the amount that helped them with, during the time of COVID. So I think technology, coordination and programs that in, uh, should be introduced that help to achieve those goals sustainably and effectively. Okay. Uh, can okay. I add something for just 30 seconds? All right, yes. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, there is a common council of interest in Pakistan uh, working very vibrantly. Uh, it involves the local government and uh, federal government uh, institutions, sectors, where there is a common issue in Pakistan, like a uh, um, defense issue, like a COVID issue or something else, uh, energy crisis, there is a, a common uh, CCI, Council of Common Interest, where integration is there for all the provincial and federal government institutions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we'll be leaving soon. Uh, thank you all the participants for the uh, breakout group discussion session. I think it went well. And uh, is there anyone from any group uh, who wants to report back? Uh, can can I invite someone? Please. From, Robin, uh, yes. from our group, we had our group leader, Elias, who wanted to kindly make the presentation of our summary. Sure, sure. Ms. Elias, you have the floor. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, uh, we had, uh, though time was very limited, but to some extent, our members uh, shared their experiences from their countries. And uh, we mentioned some of the challenges when it comes to uh, coordinating activities or uh, aligning with SDGs. Like in Africa, we have got issues like governance in terms of the implementation of these uh, goals or frameworks. And also uh, human capital development is also still a challenge. We uh, expect that through the capacity building and uh, this from the government ministries, department and agencies. And also from experience from other countries like Malaysia, uh, the country is a little bit more organized, coordinated, uh, easy to control most of the activities because they are well coordinated, the transparency, uh, 
And also uh, the ministries are connected. Therefore, we have this uh, good experience from the, the group. And also from uh, other countries, we have seen the challenges like connectivity because of the network, I should say technology, also a challenge because it's a technology is a main facilitator of uh, some of the, ECD, the SDG uh, activities or frameworks. And also the need for human capital development is also, was also raised here. But during the COVID, uh, COVID uh, challenge, uh, some countries uh, experience a difficult time because uh, the virtual meeting cannot uh, be you know, connected to the whole country, very limited to some areas because of connectivity. Uh, some of the suggestions uh, in this, in the whole of the, in the whole of the country, a kind of, uh, of, of uh, strategy can be well uh, implemented if it can be customized so, so that it can be uh, seen very fruitfully in all countries which are going to implement. It's a very good strategy, but uh, ministries, department needs to be well coordinated and should be customized as per the needs of that particular country or it should be localized. This is just some of the, of the summary that you say as per what uh, our group members have contributed with just a very limited time we had. Thank you. Elias, uh, if there is any other group member who wants to say the group discussion. Uh, okay. Yes, we were, uh, we just, uh, in our group, we discussed uh, the federal government and provincial government integration among different type of policies. Uh, I'm from Pakistan, Masood Ahmed Akhtar. We discussed that uh, how government uh, interact uh, in common interest. There is a Council of Common Interest in Pakistan, CCI, uh, that focuses upon specific problems that, that those are associated with provincial government and there involves a common interest for all sort of people, either in uh, federal government or in provincial government. And we discussed the social security program in Pakistan and pensionary benefits to uh, old age people where all private sector is registered by uh, an institution which is known as employees old age benefit institution, which registered all uh, uh, employers having more than five employees. And their service is uh, uh, counted at our pool. Uh, the employer has to pay a minimum amount of fund and that is contributed to a major pool which is being invested in someone else and after uh, when the claimant or employee got age of 60 for male and 55 for female those are awarded as old age benefits like pension grants and invalidity pension etc Sorry, uh, we have Aisa Akram uh, who raised her hand, uh, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Aisha Akram from Pakistan and working as assistant director under the Ministry of Overseas Pakistan and Human Development, Human Resource Development. As far as the group discussion uh, of my group is concerned, uh, mostly the members, uh, participant of the group uh, identify the problems like governance, weak local government, conflict of interest among the functionaries and the coordination is uh, a lack of coordination among the functionaries, main functionaries, uh, which have the responsibility to implement the strategies and policies for the implementation of SDGs. And uh, my group members and the other participants uh, give suggestions like capacity building. We must focus on the capacity building once the one uh, suppose I am uh, able and I am fully, uh, I have opportunities to utilize my all talent and my uh, resources and education. And uh, we must set the priority of the policies and we must identify the sectors uh, uh, which needs more uh, attention of the government like education and the health. 
once i am educated and i am healthy then i must play an active and important role in the development of my society and for my welfare and the well being of my society my surroundings and my neighbors and like this we must set priority and we must focus on the capacity building of each and every individuals of the country thank you aisa akram well, we have uh, mr anton antoin so can you please summarize in one minute yes yes uh, our group uh, has discussed about uh, this sdg goals in uh, our respective countries and uh, <clears throat> the main challenge also we have seen uh, are not very far from what other has discussed uh, we we have seen the the, the human capital is a very a very big problem because uh, we need to uh, to address all the question and the problems we have uh, uh, but with the citizen centered planning so we can uh, imagine how it would be difficult if uh, the human capital is really less, especially in these developing countries and uh, another challenge you have seen is uh, diversity uh, especially in terms of, uh, of resources and, and political differences so so we can uh, think like uh, uh, the coordination would be very very difficult if there is no uh, if we also have this diversity in political differences and uh, we can uh, be happy to give like our uh, recommendation as uh, we want uh, and we think it is possible if there is a full integration of our SDG goals in the national planning and uh, uh, so that it can also facilitate uh, the continuous monitoring and framework in all the countries. So uh, that's what we have been discussed in the show. Thank you, uh, Antonia. So uh, in the interest of time, uh, now I would like to open floor for one or two questions, please. If you have any question, please raise your hand and uh, please uh, ask our presenter, me and uh, Mr. Singh. Hello? Okay, uh, we have Masood, Mr. Masood. Hello? Yeah, we have Ma Mr. Masood raise yeah. his hand. So, yeah, I okay. have I have one question uh, that in any country, when the policy maker formulate or implement policy, they formulate in government point of view, rather they, uh, why they don't focus upon the citizens point of view. <clears throat> I have posted this question in chat session too. Can you clarify this and uh, uh, let us know why, go uh, why should government focus upon citizens? perspective rather than government's perspective. Whenever the government policy maker thought that this policy should be adopted to all of the country, uh, they just rely upon the interests of government. It should be citizen oriented. How it can be possible? Thank you, uh, Mr. Masood for the question. Uh, Mr. Sim, you would like to answer this question? Yes, yes, thank you. They're very good uh, points, I think. Uh, yeah, let's uh, take this example. Let's compare uh, two different uh, examples of city governments. There is a city government who is, who, which is very uh, responsive to citizens' demands and needs. And the, the other uh, government, which is not so responsive to uh, the citizens' needs and uh, demands. Uh, for example, in the registration of a, a new car, uh, when uh, some uh, citizens go to a uh, local government, some uh, frontline officer don't uh, uh, respond to the demands. They uh, just uh, complain to them. I am. I have a lot of work. Please uh, don't come here. Don't could. Don't go to the next uh, city government. Uh, they will treat you. Uh, we are uh, loaded of a lot of uh, uh, work, so uh, we uh, do not want your uh, application like that. Uh, so the but the next uh, uh, the the uh, nearby the city government 
they welcomed the CTE, the, the citizens' uh, application for a car new car registration uh, because they have a, a very good system. They have a, a they uh, trust uh, the government or city government authority to the private sector and they uh, contract uh, the, uh, between them and they share the digital government system together. So the work is spread, the workload is spread uh, and they can get, the city government can get a uh, uh, higher uh, tax, tax revenue they can get and the uh, uh the other uh, government city government there are uh, so many complaints from uh, citizens uh, uh, in treating the uh, civil uh, applications so the uh, private business they leave the uh, city because it is very uh, uh, uncomfortable with the uh, private sector so they uh, leave the uh, uh, base the uh, private, but company base to uh, other move uh, to other uh, cities, uh, so the city revenues will decrease and the uh, jobs will decrease. But the frontline officers never mind about that. So uh, for that, I think the leadership should have the sense of uh, the risk risk signal. If they find the frontline officers are very uh, busy with many applications, they should come up with a very good idea to trust the uh, authority to private sector and share the uh, digital government system with the private sector. Then uh, they, uh, the frontline officers would be happy and they, they can increase their revenues. So uh, yeah, there, there would be many uh, ways to solve those kind of uh, problems. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sim. Uh, so, uh, in addition to this, uh, in addition to, to the point uh, as uh, declared by Lokan Shim, I would like also add uh, one thing in this question. The implementing agency uh, must take some survey of the specific population before implementing any sort of uh, policy or uh, uh, for the uh, sake of uh, citizens. If the uh, response rate of population is good to that, to, um, to that policy, it should be implemented to whole country. And if the policy has a negative response to uh, micro population, that should not be implemented to whole country. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, I think uh, it uh, is, is a good opinion. Uh, the survey of the demands of needs and uh, also the interviews with the frontline officers uh, also would be very important. Uh, even if you want to improve the uh, acceleration of uh, the uh, administrative process, if the frontline officers are uh, very busy and uh, very hard, tough with uh, workloads, you should uh, uh, consider their uh, uh, yeah, shoes also there. Uh, you, you should uh, also make efforts to alleviate the burden. Yeah, so yeah, together with the uh, survey for the citizens and the uh, interviews or, uh, or surveys for the frontal officers should be parallel, go in parallel, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Sim. You. So uh, we can invite one more last question. Uh, I think uh, Elias, okay. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, my guess, I would like maybe to get some experience of the whole of government approach. I agree 100% that the digital government uh, to some extent, I should say maybe 100%, it can improve the SDG localization. But there are normally challenges which are facing most of, of our country, and maybe I should focus specifically on African countries because of the, I should say, maybe the framework or the system of our governments. We have got the uh, ministries, departments, and agencies. And mostly when you are appointed as a minister, you are given some objective mission 
But at the end, all ministries should attain the vision of the government, it might be a national development vision and the like. <coughs> but when it comes to performance, the evaluation, evaluation or assessment, as a minister, you have to make sure that you reach all the goals which you are supposed to, make sure that you facilitate the activity until you reach this particular kind of objective or mission. But it happened, most of the time it happens that these ministries, they work in like in isolation because you have to strive for resources so that your ministry moves. Therefore, in this regard, you find like, to some extent, they are just something like silos. So, because I know most of the country, it's a little bit challenging implementing our business processes or the, the kind of services in our government, 100%. Still, some of the activity will be run out of a, of a digital way. Therefore, there are some issues like sharing of information can be a little bit difficult. And also check and balance or co 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 collaboration between the ministries. If, I'll get, if you can get some kind of a sharing from the best experience, maybe it will give us a little bit maybe highlight so that at least maybe with the little resources we have in Africa, maybe we can improve our governments. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. If I may answer uh, some of this uh, question, you are right. In uh, some in our developing countries, there are like cognition, there are challenges to make sure that there is a whole of government approach. And you know, every time the minister level, uh, it doesn't even reach to the uh, local level also. So uh, maybe what we can do is, uh, you know, when we start developing this kind of strategies. We use, uh, from the beginning, we use a cross-cutting role of digital technologies in uh, design and implementing of like public policies and in achieving policy outcomes. And uh, it also depends on like the whole of government is also depend on, you know, the alignment of core work processes, uh, um, like such as accountability system, like you mentioned, budget and information management, as well as the management of critical gaps. And another uh, issue I want to highlight is like engage all level of government, like national, regional, local from the uh, very beginning, like, uh, you know, like central local steering and bottom up approach. Like they are the success factor at, as all the actors at all level of government need to be engaged. And another is uh, we can engage the uh, participation of parliamentaries, uh, local government representatives, non-governmental uh, stakeholders in review process to contribute to changing working dynamic and improving, you know, con coordination at the local level. That also will, uh, you know, will be useful for monitoring and uh, evaluation and transparency and accountability. And we also need to establish uh, this communication network, like, you know, communication through all channels, uh, like in Korea, like they have online. So online through workshop, uh, like, you know, it is very essential to bring all actors on board in the implementation of the, uh, SDGs and national policies and communicating progresses. And another important thing is uh, providing support. So uh, cap capacity development initiatives, like they are the feature of follow-up government and including like include building uh, repositories of like shared lessons and experience and practice, uh, you know, guidelines, joint training, networking initiatives and access to learning and development support. And another one is also like uh, from, uh, from uh, what I think like structure that align with the purpose. You know, the whole of government approach may need like more permanent structure, including like legislation, organizational redesign, new processes and new competencies. And the work process uh, like you know, that matter most in whole of government work also include clear and sometimes uh, restructured line of accountability, uh, budgetary parameter, uh, roles, risk management system, and performance management system that reward whole of government work. And uh, definitely network governance is very involved, uh, in, important. That involves new form of accountability, target budgetary management system and performance indicator. It also requires um, a focus of, on monitoring and evaluation of policy implementation and outcome at all the levels. And definitely leadership is important and need to change our mindset, new ways of thinking we need to change our mindset like from all the levels and new work processes. And uh, we also need to you know, manage the gaps uh, for, for these challenges. Thank you very much. So uh, I think we 
have almost exceeded like uh, 10 minutes. So I would like to conclude this session and I would like to hand over, uh, hand over this to uh, Mr. Samuel Dana who will be moderating the next session. Thank you. The floor is your Mr. Dana. Thank you, Prabin, and uh, our distinguished speakers and attentive participants for such a wonderful first section. I would like to um, welcome you to this next section, which is um, the second section of the afternoon, and it will be the last for today. Uh, without much ado, I would like to greet you from wherever you are joining us from, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this section, which will focus on national to local governance for effective public uh, health emergency management. And as Prabin mentioned, I'm Dana Samuel, uh, an associate capacity development expert with UNPOG. So just would like you to know that this section is going to discuss some of the governance uh, efforts that have been implemented so far in response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And by focusing on public health emergency to highlight some of the effective role of inclusive and effective governance in this regard. And secondly, by uh, the intention or the objective of the section is to improve our knowledge on how effective, efficient uh, disaster management systems will help in improving the uh, response to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic in our various countries and societies. And especially trying to highlight the effective or the uh, crucial role of digital government and innovative technologies in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. So just would like to highlight that the section uh, has three main uh, uh, teams or areas who have the presentations two presentations, short presentations, let me put it that way, the Q&A section and the closing session that will wrap up for today. So during this uh, presentation sessions, if you have any question, just type it in the chat box whilst we address them during the Q&A section. So without much ado, I would like to invite the first speaker for this section in the person of uh, Prabin Maharajan. He's a programs management expert with UNPOG and his presentation will center on the national to local governance for effective public health management, uh, emergency management. Prabin, you have the floor and good luck. Thank you, uh, Samuel Dana. Once again, uh, I would like to uh, thank you all, uh, all the participants uh, who are very patient to join this uh, workshop. So uh, can we have a slide? Okay, so uh, I will uh, try to focus on national to local governance for effective public man uh, health emergency management. And uh, can we go to next slide? Uh, next slide, please. So I, I want to uh, first start with the principle for health emergency preparedness. Uh, there are several principles uh, initiated by World Health Organization like safeguarding, maintaining, and restoring the health and well-being of communities. Uh, these are the highest priorities for emergency preparedness. Uh, and communities are critical to effective emergency management. Like they are the first responders and the first victim also of any emergency and as such, uh, essential member of the preparedness process. So they should be represented in all the activities around developing and implementing plan for emergency preparedness. And uh, the third one is preparedness requires sustained political commitment, partnership and funding. So this is very important. And the management of emergencies by authorities, including government often has significant political dimensions political leadership and attention combined with strong community and national ownership should be accorded to the preparedness in a sustained manner. And uh, the fourth one is achieving uh, emergency preparedness has a cost, but this is an investment in health, safety, security, and development. So sustained funding should be aligned with the costed prioritized preparedness measure based on uh, risk and uh, the cap capacity assessment. And health system and emergency preparedness uh, reinforce one another. Uh, 
along with other system contrib uh, other systems that contribute to the resilience of communities and countries. And also uh, the emergency preparedness should be addressed with a all hazard approach, like many elements of emergency preparedness are common to all hazards and plan for you know, emergency preparedness should be designed to incorporate them. And a risk management approach underpins the assessment, planning and implementation of emergency management actions, including uh, prevention and mitigation of risk, preparedness activities, coordinated response, and recovery and reconstruction. And a whole of society approach is very much uh, critical for emergency preparedness and addressing the health dimension of emergency preparedness require the health system to interact with other government, uh, government sector at all level of the national system and uh, the commercial sectors and the civil society, including non-governmental and community organization. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here I want to focus on the governance elements of preparedness at all level. So the uh, overall responsibility for safeguarding, maintaining and restoring the health and well-being of communities lies with the national government. And many of the rights and obligations set out by uh, international health, uh, you know, the Sendai framework and other international agreement are the responsibility of, of all the members. So usually national, our uh, subnational policies are legislations, describe the roles and responsibilities of ministries, local government and stakeholders for emergency preparedness. And preparedness efforts should be made for emergencies that occur on the local or national scale, as well as for large scale disasters and pandemics with international uh, ramification. Next slide, please. So uh, there are certain requirements for public health uh, capacity. For example, for organ organizational structure, we need institutional capacity, program deliver, uh, delivery structure, public health aspect of uh, healthcare services, capacity to respond to emergencies. For partnership, uh, we need formal and informal partnership, joined up government like a uh, whole of government and whole of, uh, whole of government approach, financial resources, uh, like financial resource generation, uh, financial resource allocation, uh, and leadership and governance, responsibilities for public health, public like policy making for public health, uh, expertise within the Ministry of Health, leadership qualities in the health sector, and uh, human resources is very important, and training and development of the human resources, public health competencies, and professional associations. Uh, next slide, please. So here uh, I derived this from uh, the Espresso Enhancing Risk Management Capabilities Guideline. This is the SEAL model, uh, which is uh, sharing knowledge, harmonizing capacities, institutionalizing coordination, engaging stakeholders, leveraging investment, developing communication. So this SEAL model uh, shown in this picture encompasses a set of strategic recommendation around six different themes for how to enhance risk management capabilities through governance. The different recommendation uh, contained in each of the six themes should be seen as uh, steps toward achieving each of the overall goal. Example, for example, like engaging stakeholders. As illustrated, uh, the six recommendations in the model revolve around the traditional disaster risk management phase, like uh, prevention, preparedness, response and recovery, highlighting how health emergency practices are dependent on the range of institutions, policies and structures. Next slide, please. So uh, we need effective coordination mechanism between national and local governments and government, which is very critical. So uh, establishing local coordination mechanism and ensuring they are linked with uh, national coordination mechanism is a top priority for all the actors working on this crisis management, since these coordination mechanisms often have uh, you know, different but mutually reinforcing responsibilities. For example, the national coordination mechanism may work on the bigger picture, example like um, national level advocacy, data collection and management, working with media, assisting like other cluster sector at the national level, Whereas the field coordination mechanism, local uh, level, may work more on the level of 
uh, operational guidance and oversight of program implementation. Uh, when the national and local uh, coordination mechanism, mechanism do not coordinate, their respective responsibilities are compromised. For example, the national coordinate, coordination mechanism cannot uh, adequately meet its national level emergency response responsibilities unless it understands what is happening at the local level. So uh, those working at the local level in turn cannot meet the responsibilities for providing emergency responses unless they are speaking with the same voice as the national coordination mechanism about uh, guiding principle, best practices, model, and uh, so on. Next slide, please. So uh, this is one example, innovative uh, approach like in Korea, Republic of Korea, interagency coordination for emergency response. So uh, Korea is making efforts to foster interagency coordination in public health emergency response. And uh, evidence of coordination failure in crisis management have prompted a major reflection in Korea on interagency coordination and crisis leadership. Uh, for example, both during the ferry Seoul disaster and the Mars outbreak, applying crisis manual by you know, individual organizations proved largely insufficient to reduce the public health consequences of this crisis. So since then, a uh, revision of the governance of crisis management uh, represents substantive changes toward uh, improving in, in interagency coordination. So the establishment of the National Disaster Safety Control Center under Ministry of the Interior and Safety as a joint suit uh, situation center with represent, representative from all the relevant ministries and agencies is promising. And the center is equipped with, equipped with um, appropriate situation awareness and information sharing tools. And a problem solving uh, doctrine has been, you know, core to its design based on comprehensive situation judgment meeting. And a direct link to political leadership facilitates decision making with the involvement of Minister of the Interior and Safety or the Prime Minister, depending on the crisis scale, as shown in the figure. Next slide, please. So these five uh, priorities, uh, they are uh, they are mentioned in the Hugo Framework for Action, uh, action which identify these five priorities for action towards the strengthening community and uh, country res resilience to disaster. The first one is emergency risk management for health as a national and local priority. Uh, we need like uh, development and implementation of health and multi-sectoral policies, strategies, strategies and legislation to provide direct support for emergency risk management, especially at the local level. Health risk assessment and early warning, uh, assessment of risk to health and health system, determining uh, risk management measure based on the risk assessment, and uh, there are three broad elements which are usually considered in risk assessment like hazard analysis, vulnerability analysis, capacity analysis. And the uh, third one is education and information to build a culture of health, safety and resilience at all levels. You know, through education, training and technical guidance, uh, strengthen the knowledge, skills and attitude of professional in health and other sector for managing the health risks of disaster. And the fourth one is reduction of underlying risk factor to health and health system, like uh, property reduction measure and system in that improve, uh, improving the underlying health status of people at risk of disaster. And uh, the last one is emergency preparedness for effective health response and risk uh, recovery at all level. So uh, this one is like emergency preparedness, including response planning, uh, training, pre-positioning of health supplies, uh, development of such capacities and exercise for healthcare professional and other emergency services, uh, emergency service personnel is critical for uh, effective performance of health sector in the responses. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we, there is a good, uh, you know, process called the golden hour, the road to recovery. So uh, during the first hour, following the onset of emergency or disaster, the leader can you know, build confidence in emergency response and potential recovery strategies from subordinates, supervisors, team members, citizen, clients, establish confidence in their ability, abilities to uh, manage or coordinate and effective responses and recovery, begin uh, guiding like, you know, order, 
guiding order in the concerted effort to bring operation back to normal. However, uh, there are certain actions that must be considered as soon as possible after the disaster, that is the golden hour. So immediate emergency need. Uh, you, can, you cannot fully begin recovery until immediate emergency needs are met. So this should be your first priority, like uh, fire, medical, search and rescue, evacuation, uh, protection of life and properties, and uh, bring bring together your bringing together your team. So assemble a team of your uh, decision maker. Uh, do not make decision in a vacuum, and uh, teams should be multidisciplinary. Subject matter experts should be involved. Remember that uh, you cannot see and address all issues for like from every single angle. And uh, what resources can be used to recover? Uh, you have to be able to assess what resources uh, are available or if assistance is necessary from the company's jurisdiction or donor. And uh, resources can be personal equipment or possible data. Mutual aid might be uh, available from unaffected areas and so on. And then begin recovery. Uh, recovery can begin simultaneously with the responses, like communicate recovery goals and strategies, reestablish critical operation and so on and uh, bring them back to normal like a uh, continuous continue reco uh, recovery process and uh, continue uh, communication with your con constituents stakeholder document what can be improved upon and uh, develop and strengthen and improve upon disaster mitigation preparedness response and uh, recovery plan if needed establish a new normal like uh, now we are having like new normal for the COVID-19. Next slide, please. Uh, so digital government tools on the COVID-19 pandemic especially is forcing government and societies to turn towards digital technologies to respond to the crisis in a short term and uh, resolve socioeconomic repercussions in the mid term and reinvent, reinvent existing policies and tools in the longer term. Uh, next slide, please. But uh, government often lack the financial and human resources capabilities to quickly and efficiently develop digital tools that can support people during a crisis situation. Therefore, uh, building partnership with private technology companies, social entrepreneurs, or other national and international organizations can represent an effective way of government uh, to make use of existing technologies to meet the needs of people and soften the impact of the crisis on their life. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, since the crisis had put you know, a public service under stress, government are also to, also to deploy effective digital technologies to contain the outbreak like uh, this COVID-19. And most of the in innovative uh, quick to market solution have stemmed up from private sector. However, the crisis has exposed the need for government leadership in the development and adaptation of new technologies such as artificial intelligence, uh, robotic to ensure an effective provision of public services. So uh, digital technologies you know, is very critical in facing COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Next slide, please. So here, uh, digital health uh, technologies can facilitate, pa uh, facilitate pandemic strategy and response in way that are difficult to achieve manually as shown in the figure like uh, you know, countries such as Republic of Korea have integrated digital technologies into government coordinated containment and mitigation processes, including uh, surveillance, testing, contact tracing, and strict quarantine, which could be associated with the early uh, flattening of the, their incident curves. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the, the COVID-19, uh, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic has short, medium and long-term effects on the local government uh, functioning and finance. So while in the short term, uh, the priorities are to manage the emergency and public health crisis, medium term priorities will be more about managing the economic, social and public finance crisis. While in the long term, the current pandemic calls for increasing the resilience of our social and uh, economic systems. Next slide, please. And uh, we, we need to consider some of these uh, things in planning for local preparedness for health emergencies, like optimal preparedness in local settlement is critical for, for effective national, regional, and global response to COVID-19. 
the strategic pre preparedness and uh, response plan, the strategy of update and critical preparedness, readiness and response actions, provided key consideration and action that all the countries need to take for health emergencies. To be effective, any public health measure must be uh, implementable and designed in a way that will promote willingness to comply as such um, in planning for health and other sector across all uh, stages of emergency management. Local authorities need to additionally undertake the concentration uh, as shown in this slide, like there are uh, different like ad hoc coordinated multi-sectoral whole of government and whole of society approach, promote coordination and coordination in measure across different level of governance and those kind of thing. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, there are five key messages uh, that local governments should focus on to prevent the spread of uh, disasters such as, you know, a pandemic such as COVID-19 and to develop resilience to and preparedness for event of uh, similarly destructive nature. First one is coordinated local plan in preparedness of effective response to health uh, risk impact. Uh, risks and crisis. Hello, uh, please, yeah. can you be wrapping up? Yeah, oh, sure. Risks okay. and crisis communication and uh, communi community engagement that encourage compliance with measure and uh, appropriate contextually appropriate approaches to public health measures, especially physical distancing, hand hygiene and respiratory ethics and all. And uh, uh, so next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, we need to have like empower uh, citizen. Uh, we need to, you know, make the government resilient and all, all, all other things like encourage emergency preparedness, enhance integration in all the local bodies and national bodies. Yeah, uh, this is the end my, uh, of my presentation. If you have any question, I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Prabhen, for such an informative and in-depth presentation that tried to highlight how national and local or national to local coordination are very effective for emergency management, especially for COVID-19. So behind this presentation, one finds that there is something about government. There is a coordination agency that has to be in place. What is the role of local government apart from national and um, uh, central government and what are the other stakeholders who are in there, be it private, be it a, 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 a civil society organization, the academia, the research. So all these have to come together to give us the right responses in our various uh, countries. And in the center of all this, there should be a coordination agency that coordinate the activities and resources and capacities of all these uh, things to happen. So I would now like to use this opportunity to invite our second speaker in the person of Ms. Anna Todland. Uh, Anna is a program management officer with the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction here in Incheon, Republic of Korea. She is going to give us a presentation on integrating public health uh, emergency or public health into emergency and disaster risk planning. So I would like to call on Anna, the floor is yours and good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. You hear me? You yes, hear me very well? good. Yeah. Okay. So um, my name is Anna Cristina Torlun and I work for the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction here based in Incheon, Korea. So the Office for Northeast Asia and the Global, Ed and Global Education and Training Institute. Um, is, are you going to share my presentation or should I do it? Okay, great, thank you. Thanks, perfect. So my presentation will be about integrating public health into emergency and disaster risk reduction planning. And Praveen has been giving already a very detailed presentation, which I, I listened carefully, but I, I just wish to, to remind you that already at the time of Ebola epidemic in the West Africa, as you remember, and the uh, Zika virus outbreak, uh, both has demonstrated the need of, for a multi-hazard approach to strengthen the health system 
resilience and integrating the health emergency into the disaster management system. So this system should not be looking at silos, the emergency, the, the health sector doing the preparedness and health uh, preparations and the disaster risk management isolated. So this already at the time of the Ebola and cycle we learned from. But that was in 2014, if you remember, or Ebola and Psyche was in 2000, Zika was in 2016. Then four years later, the COVID-19 pandemic has further confirmed the urgency of this integration that I'm mentioning. Now, in terms of the response to COVID-19, many countries set up pandemic governance structure that include health ministries, disaster management agencies, and a variety of other ministries, such as security, social services, information, education, to name you a few. And one example is Korea. This is because uh, governments recognize that the, the amount of full spectrum response, it was important to strengthen the coordination between these ministries. Moving forward, this cross-sectoral collaboration needs to be maintained and extend. It is just as important that the health emergency strategies and the preparedness plans local level to ensure the strengthens of each other and utilize them and the gaps are addressed. So in this context, uh, the, if you can present the, first, the second slide, please. I will present, I, re, I just come back to the understanding of what we mean by resilience. And we use the resilience terminology from the Sendai framework. Praveen shared about the Yogo framework for action. That was the predecessor of the Sendai framework. But the Sendai framework built on the Yogo framework for action. So the Sendai framework brought the, the um, concept of the ability to withstand and bounce back from both acute shocks of natural and man-made, such as flood, earthquakes, hurricanes, wildfires, but also the chronic stresses that stays in the city, the groundwater depletion, deforestation, socioeconomic problems. What is interesting to note here, next, next one please, is that um, we want a resilience like the roly-poly toy that you, you can ban but you come back or the the concept from japan that uh, uh, bamboos go down 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 with the strong winds but stand up next one please so um it is important also to note that doesn't die framework has already integrated uh the the biological hazards the health related hazards was already in the Sunday framework, so with clear actions for national and local governments to, to integrate. Uh, the Bangkok, just a few uh, information on some other principles, but the Bangkok principles were adopted in 2016 in a conference with member states in Bangkok, as the name it says, in which also calls to governments for this integration between the health systems plans and preparedness and the disaster risk reduction plans. When we look at the, this uh, slide that uh, maybe some of you are familiar through the global assessment report, this slide shows you the importance to see the systems of systems or the systemic risks as we call, because in, this is a Delta city and you know the Delta city can have floods, uh, uh, can have uh, sea levels raised, uh, landslides, but in this, this is not um, very simple. It was done by uh, some specific scientific technology people to show you this slide. What is important to highlight is that the systems in the city has to be resilient in, and look at different uh, risk in the city. Uh, this is the example that health, the health systems also has to be to uh, be in in an area of safety because otherwise if you have a pandemic and you have like in countries has happened over the last year other risks related to natural hazards the hospital has to stand up the hospital has to take care from the patients and the services has to be safe and resilient not only only to, to look at the people with uh, coming with the pandemic, but those who have cancer, 
who have requirement uh, uh, another disease and heart disease as heart, heart surgery. My mom came to Korea to have a heart surgery during the pandemic. She came to Korea, she was well attended and she left Costa Rica. Just to give you an example, where a system works, where a system and uh, the health system works uh, with all the security to visit my mom, I have to have the COVID test, all the family has COVID tests, etc. They have a system prepared in place and also uh, um, uh, try and discuss. Next one, please. So this is to inform you on how what COVID-19 demonstrates very much is the key message that only one sector cannot work alone. The city should look all the departments in the way of assistance, including the health, the healthcare and the public health. So this is quite important. It's not only the infrastructure system, the energy, the water because of natural hazards, but the integration on biological hazards has to be done through the healthcare systems integration. Next one, please. When we look at the resilience, it is not something that we can look or discuss that is something easy to do. We do the plan, the plan is adopted uh, by the council. It is a process. It's a process that requires uh, decades, days, hours, uh, weeks. It is a journey when we look at the resilience. Because if you look at uh, this slide, um, if you look carefully when we will share, it will show you the, the, the long run of the risk and how you have to really, if you want to build that resilience, you have to go through different process. It's not just to prepare for the disaster, but you requires legislation, for example, change of legislation. Um, in the example, for example, Japan is a good example when they always, they have an earthquake that happened. They check what is the failures, what they have to change, that legislation is changed. Um, the next one is, for example, emergency planning and simulation. You have to make drills. You have to be prepared at, to the response. Um, something that happens quickly after a disaster, when the disaster happens, is the, the impact you need to, to respond to it, to have the search capacity, and then the recovery and re reconstruction. Recovery and reconstruction plans has to be done well ahead of any disaster happen. The local authorities have to have, and they are methodologies. The International Recovery Platform in Japan have extremely very good uh, recovery, pre-disaster recovery planning methodology to do so. Next one, please. When we look now into the health uh, as a, as a uh, disease management functions, it's also the same. We need to look as a resilience process for uh, a long process for the disease, it's a journey. And we learned this from, from the pandemic. We need to know the long run exposure. We need to also make some uh, clear uh, pandemic planning and simulation. We have to measure the month, how much time we need uh, for lockdowns, what is the social implications, the economic implications. We need to look at that. And also, some of the uh, things that happened immediately after the pandemic was uh, officially declared is the key important action, like in Korea they did, uh, is about contact tracing uh, for the first um, cities cases, for example. Next one, please. This is to give you an idea that the resilience uh, both uh, for natural hazards, but also for disease management requires a long term. Could you continue? So we can have the resilience U shape. Again, next one and next one, please. Yes, thank you. So the resilience U shape is what we was uh, also shared by Pravin. So I will do very short is the top down information all the national to local vertical uh, integration. Um, for example, uh, deliver the information, the data. Uh, one point that Pravin mentioned was about uh, make the plans on evidence base. For that, you need collection of data for operations. Monitor trends, events, localization, and between the citizens, they need to also have information 
corruption and often social media base enabled um, reliable information don't follow into the infodemic we have been doing many webinars on this and also uh, from from bottom up uh, feedback to notifications and also the crowdsourcing is a very good way on data and trends and events that the citizens can provide to the local authority. This is uh, the example when we use for uh, resilience from, from natural hazards. If we look next one, next one, and you can do three times the same, the response to pandemics and disease management, the same approach is also uh, possible. And can you please do again? three times. So the top-down, the side-to-side -side, and the bottom-up approach in the terms of the top-down data on pandemic progress by local authorities, advice, very important. Uh, this top-down city or uh, go national to city information is very important to build the trust. To build the trust. I, I am as a, a sitting citizen here in, um, I am an international staff in, based in Korea, but I feel trust on the information that the government is given to the citizen. I feel myself reliable, reliable that I can read the, the press release every day. So that is very important, the top-down approach on information, reliable information. Then uh, citizen to citizen, uh, the data on neighborhoods, health resources, they are, the, the cities, the um, local authorities have published a lot of information and the bottom-up also uh, questions, information, and also uh, crowdsourcing of data. Next one, please. In terms of disaster risk reduction, we have a initiative, global initiative that calls MCR 2030. And if you can look in any email, you have the, in every, in every Google, you can find MCR 2030 link. This is a, a very interesting initiative with many co-partners around the world working with cities and governments. In term, and it has a specific tools that help cities to build their resilience uh, around 10 essentials. And those 10 essentials looks at different aspects of the resilience from governance, uh, coordination, information, identification, the, the risk, um, risk management and financial, it is what we call the enablers. And we have some operational essentials, which is urban design, national um, buffers, safe work, national buffer, ecosystem-based solutions, as we can call, uh, institutional capacity. You were, I was in a group, they were mentioning a lot about the importance of institutional capacity cultural uh, increase, social and cultural resilience, societal capacity. I also heard in the group, you were talking about how you integrate the private sector, the other stakeholders. So this is this integration of social capacity is very important, increase social, uh, societal capacity. Eight, it's about infrastructure resilience. And the last two are for response, preparedness, early warnings and response. Next one, please. So same. When we look um, in the, we, I mentioned about when you looked at breast um, uh, resilience, you look at chronic stresses and acute events, the interaction between them. Chronic stresses can be, for example, uh, in terms of social people who, how many people are not employee, the poverty of the city, or even the, the situation of um, um, all buildings in the city or, or cultural heritage that you have to take care. But acute events, it's when we come with the earthquakes, the flood, the storm, the heat wave and pandemics. Next one. How it is this examples for chronic stresses and acute events, it will look from the lens of as a pandemic. You look that chronic stresses can be the economic stress, the poverty, the impact of the of the pandemic, of the long-term um, closing lockdowns in people's uh, employment, the lack of open spaces make it harder to people to exercise and maintain social distances, the air pollution can be increased, the air pollution can increase the susceptibility of the disease, some people who have the problem uh, in the lungs, and then the acute event itself. So it, it will exacerbate the chronic stresses, 
for example, enforce closures, force local businesses to close, uh, and they have problems with such as the food storage, the coffees are closed, etc. And the public transportation also is forced to close, so preventing people to go who may not have cars, preventing them to go to work possible. So this is the kind of interactions from chronic stresses and acute events looking from the lens of uh, the pandemic. Next one, please. So we have tools available. Uh, this is the Disaster Resilience Scorecard for Cities. This is a specific um, looking at the natural hazards. And you have in the presentation the links to download, to use them. They have different levels. And next one, please. And you have also the same, the scorecard health addendum for cities. And this is quite important that we have the, the city scorecard assessment. And then now we have a public health addendum scorecard that we developed with WHO. And this is to support pandemic management because you have to look at pandemic disaster risk management. You need to look also disaster resilience using the scorecard when you use this different uh, integration the MCR 2030, when you look this multi-sectoral mechanism will support the pandemic management. There is a very good uh, guidance from WHO, which is uh, quite recent, is the WHO guidance on health emergency and disaster risk management that I can share with you the link in the chat. And uh, we have, as I mentioned, the public health system resilience scorecards. There is a new guidelines on WHO guidance for safe COVID-19 vaccination. And we are working in the words into action on integrating health sector and the other. So there is tools available. I, um, next one, please. I would like to share with you, um, this is the scorecard, uh, resilience system scorecard that you can use for free in your city. It's an assessment that will tell you what are going well, what was well before and during the pandemic, and what is not well. Next one, please. Um, and the structure of this tool uh, of the scorecard, um, it was created to using the, the 10 essentials I shared before. It used the same name of the essential. It's not a medical or epidemiological tool, but that these disciplines will inform answers as well. Uh, Next one, please. It has a lot of linkages between the two, two areas, but there is something very good that you can look in the left side of the, this, this table. Uh, you have to organize uh, the governance, the risk understanding, the financial architecture, and looking from the lens of the healthcare system. So are you adequately, um, you have protection of uh, protection of funding available, the resilience dividends. Uh, each of the 10 essentials are adapted to the uh, public health uh, system. Next one, and with that one, I finish. Next one, please. So just one, next one again. I want to show you two of the questions, simple questions that this tool are available. This is designed for local authorities. And one question is if disaster risk planning includes public health emergencies into consideration into their plans. Sometimes we do the plans, but we don't uh, bring into the discussions uh, relevant representatives from the health departments. And secondly, another example is, do we have sufficient skilled health professionals to maintain public health around disasters? So this means doctor, nurses, health professionals, are they also uh, has been trained on disaster risk management? Last one. Thank you. The last slide is the key resources for you. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of guidance and tools available. Um, they are simple. I think the scorecard assessment are simple tools that many cities are now using. Uh, we do training for them. But the most important message is that we need to continue to uh, strengthen uh, the integration of pandemic risk management strategies with the already uh, disaster risk reduction uh, local strategies. Over to you. Sorry, I think Dana, thank you. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Anna, for such an excellent presentation, which highlighted the processes and ways for integrating public health 
into emergency management and disaster risk planning. I think um, your presentation brought up a lot of new dimensions and ideas, especially on emerging issues. And I just noted a few of them down. So one of it was uh, the need for a multi-hazard approach based on the lessons from the Zika virus and Ebola in, uh, in, the, in the previous ones. And the need for a cross-sectoral approach to managing health or planning and especially the indispensable role of planning throughout all these processes, then the integrated nature of systems, including healthcare systems, uh, which should be based, or all these processes should be based on evidence or information based, or our planning system should be evidence or information based, leveraging or trying to exploit the benefit of crowdsourcing. Uh, in building resilience, because uh, resilience building is very important, especially in the pre-disaster recovery planning process. And you brought in another one about a bottom-up, top-down, side-by-side. I think in future we can look at diagonal, if there's some kind of uh, other ways of looking at it, when we have other multiple stakeholders. So if we have the stakeholders, we have the top, the down, then we have to look at how to have a kind of diagonal inter interaction. And I think uh, in all, you also shared with us uh, these innovative tools, which are emerging, especially the ones that are coming at the back of uh, this COVID-19. And I think they are pretty very, very important for our next step going forward, especially in recovering and building back from uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So thank you very much once again. And I would now like to move straight to the question and answer session. We'll be coming to each of you, our speakers, to respond to some of the questions from uh, our uh, attentive and very kind uh, participants. So uh, with the question and answer section, I know we, have, uh, we are running out of time, but we'll try to make time for a couple of questions. So if you have submitted your question or not yet, you can raise your hand and receive it couple of the questions and uh, get them directed to our speakers for them to uh, respond to them. So the floor is open for questions and answers. Let me check from the chat box if whether we had a question. I have one question, Samuel, please. Okay, yes. Uh, we have uh, understand the significance of pandemic and its severe consequence upon public health. But the critical problem is that uh, most of the public are not taking this issue as serious one. Okay. Uh, uh, they consider that this is just a, a vibe which is being created by some countries why this uh, they have such type of mindset and how we can change their mindset that this is not a vibe it is a serious pandemic and it requires some serious measures to overcome this how we can ensure the generic people okay i would like to direct this question to um anna especially how do we uh, create awareness on this virus uh, to dissuade people from thinking or taking the virus serious yeah i think this is an important role for the local authorities for the for the governments to raise um the risk understanding at the city level at the citizen level and and that's quite important area of uh, uh, how people understand risk what is what is the risk for them what is the implications of the pandemic for them? At the beginning, I remember very well that many in many parts of the world were looking at the COVID-19 pandemic as a very giving less importance or less understanding because the understanding was not there. So uh, this is a fundamental area in any area of the risk reduction is to understand uh, risk and the perception of risk among the citizens. And that's why there, we need definitely important campaign information, simple messaging uh, to, 
to the from the government to the citizens, uh, from the city level, from the municipality to inform uh, citizens. Because sometimes in some areas, particularly uh, right now, we're talking about the pandemic, but some countries has not often uh, faced uh, uh, earthquake or they haven't faced a uh, a hurricane and then suddenly comes a hurricane and, and you need to explain them that the hurricane is 250 kilometers so uh, people don't know people simply don't know so that is why there is important to establish uh, campaigns awareness campaign uh, for increasing the understanding the perception of risk among among the citizens this is my my suggestion uh, thank you so uh, and, uh, the Leaders are the role model for our nations. They should follow the basic uh, uh, basic measures to avoid pandemic. They should wear mask and not embrace with other people. But when we see at our TVs and at social media that the leaders are not also following the uh, measures which are being adopted by the UNO or some other health, health ministries, why the people should take uh, this um, issue as a serious one? The leaders should take uh, the initiative step and as a role model for nations. It should be, yes. I do agree with you. I think the government has to show very clear message to the citizens um, to better understanding the need, uh, the, 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 the example of the mask, the use of the mask. Uh, give simple messages everywhere. Um, uh, I, rec I received so many in my phone from in, in this country where I, I live. It was so clear that this was important. Even as an example, my husband was not so much uh, into the mask. And, and I was, we were telling him, but there is one doctor tell, tell him, we know what we are telling you. We have lived, we have had MERS before. So why you have to learn from previous pandemic. This is not something that because COVID-19, uh, they started. They, there is lessons, and there are lessons from previous pandemic. That's my my suggestion is also to learn from previous uh, pandemics we had. Yes, exactly. Thank you Thank so you. much uh, for the question and also for the excellent response from Anna. Uh, do we have any other question? And I think the role of leadership has been very much highlighted. I think people look up to leadership and government. So, and especially if people tend to trust government, they trust the information that comes from that. And uh, also learning, you, we get to understand that those who have experienced pandemic before, they know how to approach future pandemics and even how it happens. But those who haven't experienced them before, sometimes uh, it takes time to change, you know, this mindset. So creating awareness, sharing experiences, and this is one of the reasons why we have uh, programs like this and other conferences and uh, uh, seminars to build capacities and share knowledge. So people are able to learn from others. Do we have any other question? I think we can take one more, then we try to wrap up. Then I have to leave. I have another uh, meeting, but if I may say a last word to, to the group is that okay. uh, just very briefly, we have a webinar uh, on 15 April. Uh, again, it's very interesting. It's the closing, closing of a webinar series on health systems and disaster risk reduction, going more in depth from this conversation I, I shared today. Uh, so maybe I can leave you with the information through the organizers to NPOG uh, to share with you for the 15th of April. I have to leave you. Okay, so Sarah, I will, I, we appreciate your presentation again and all the excellent uh, ideas you shared. And we say thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. So do we have any other question to the floor or any suggestion? Okay, so in the absence of a question or any other uh, inputs, I would like to um, progress to wrap up for this section. So it is time to, um, before I wrap up, I would like to kindly request each one of you. I think uh, Changyu will share uh, the information for uh, 
evaluating this program. We want to receive your feedback and know how best we can improve in future. Uh, did it really meet your expectation? What do you want us to do for the next round? And what capacity development uh, ideas do you want to add to what we are already doing to better serve member states, including where each one of us are coming from? So I'll kindly, uh, the link will be shared in the chat box where you can click and give us your feedback. Candidly, we are open to every suggestions from you and we hope to incorporate them going forward. So in closing, uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, especially our distinguished participants who are coming from other, um, who are joining us from all over the world and other countries, uh, we are very much um, impressed with your active participation and very intuitive and insightful contributions including from our speakers, uh, from uh, Professor Wang, uh, Bukyon Shim, the head of UNPOG, Mr. Bukyon Shim and uh, Prabin, who has also tried to coordinate the section and also delivered a series of presentations. And all of us who have helped in one way or the other, we express our sincerest appreciation to you for making this a success. We look forward to you joining the program next week again for another a very uh, exciting uh, session on whole of society approach for SDG localization. I say thank you very much for your kind participation. Have a nice day and all the best. Thank you.